section two. Section two. This is what it's going to cover. Everything in the bulleted, excuse me, in the bulleted section. Tonight, when you go home, here's what I would like you to do. Go back through and look at all of the points that are in black, really dark print, bold print. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. What you do is you skim every section and you read just the bold stuff. If you didn't understand what that bold section meant, read that section again. This way it'll keep locking information in. Okay? That's how we retain it. And even after you're done tomorrow night, you keep doing that every single day until you get to that permit test. All right? That's how we keep locking information in. It keeps that mind fresh. We're good? <coughs> Vehicle inspections. Why do we inspect? This will be on every single permit test. I don't care. This will show up in almost every section. If you take the air brakes, you take the passenger, you take general knowledge, you'll probably see this question in all three sections. This is critical. Why do we inspect? Safety. Safety is the most important reason you inspect your vehicle. Safety for yourself and other road users. That's going to be the answer straight across the board. Make sure you know it. Highlight it in your book. Do something with it. That's a fact. A vehicle a defect found during an inspection could save you problems later. If you have a breakdown on the road, they'll cost time and dollars even worse. A crash caused by the defect. Federal and state laws require that all drivers inspect their vehicles. Federal and state inspectors may also inspect your vehicles. If it's unfit, mark that as service. Any questions there? <coughs> Excuse me. Trust me, it gets really dry when you talk this much. The water uh, don't cut. Before I get into this, I teach the KISS method. Does everybody understand the KISS method? Keep it simple, stupid. Okay? I need it simple. That's what I do. So I view everything as simple. Because if you can understand it on a simple basis, then we can make it a little bit more complex, but you still understand it at its core. If you miss something at its core, you will never, ever understand it at its detailed level. Ever. So put this at a core. Picture this happening, okay? You're going to be driving a large vehicle down the road at a high rate of speed. You kind of probably don't want that to go wrong. So you want to inspect it. There are three times when we generally inspect the vehicle. We will inspect it before we take it down the road and use it. Check it out before you use it, right? Makes sense? We're good with this? Okay. We all go to a, a, store, a store, right? We buy things. You kind of look at it before you take it, right? Think about it. Two, we will inspect en route inspections or during the trip inspections. Okay? So that happens constantly. We're going down the road, we're watching things, we're inspecting as we're moving. And if you stop and take a break, we're going to inspect it then too. Okay? The third area is after we're all done at the end of the day, we put this bus through its workout, this vehicle through its workout, what did we break? Okay? and make sure that we check that because now if we broke something or something went wrong we can turn it into the shop they can get it serviced and fixed and ready to go for the next driver that driver may be you maybe the next person whoever it is so those are the three basic times do you understand this now so as we're going through these inspections don't let this get in your head but know what to inspect we have to inspect every component according to the laws you are responsible for every nut and bolt on that piece of machinery the air pressure on the tires, you're responsible for. Every lug nut, you're responsible for. Every bolt and every mud flap, you're responsible for. So when something goes wrong out there, they're going to look at you and say, didn't you see that on inspection? And people, it's hard sometimes to come from a car situation into a commercial vehicle. Because how many of you have actually checked all the lights on your car before you drove in here today? Minimal amount, right? How many of you put a tire gauge on all your tires? Minimal amount. You see what I'm talking about? This is our industry standard. We do this stuff. How much are the tickets? Tickets are by the hundreds, folks. And there's no allowances on this most of the time. Give me an example, little valve stem cap. Okay, these type, the pressure in these tires is a lot more than a car. Okay, we're gonna be running about 100, between 90 and 100, 510 pounds pressure in these tires. That's a lot of air, right? So they have to be metal valve stems on there. They have to be metal valve stem caps, and that air pressure should be checked all the time, right? Well, what if I'm missing the cap? 
Expansion and contraction, we have cold, warm weather. What happens if that cap loosens up and takes off on us? And we get pulled over, how much is that ticket? What do you think? 150? It's about 80 bucks per cap. And now you got, what? Six of them on the bus? Okay, minimum. Depending on how many axles are on the bus, you're responsible for every one of those. It's just a dollar cent cap. Okay, thank you. I got a question. Yes. About that. Good. I, obviously, I haven't driven commercially, but I know work like, you know, you're doing your free inspection and you say, hey, yeah, I'm missing two bells now. It's all right, just call it anyway. Okay. Most means ultimately my responsibility. It is. So if I refuse to drive the bus, is there discipline from the employer saying, okay. hey, you know, get out there? So here's how I'll handle those situations. Most of the time, it's not going to be as big of a problem anymore as what it used to be. Is it still out there? Yes. So a couple ways through it. One, I always say, sign off on it. I write it up on the inspection report. Missing two caps. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna own this. You sign off on it. Because then when you get pulled over by the DOT, since the belt stone caps really aren't going to be a critical item, right. you can get pulled over and the DOT's gonna say you're missing two caps. Yeah, I know. I caught it on my pre-trip inspection. The mechanic in the shop told me to go pound salt. How do you think that officer's gonna handle that situation? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I got this. I'm gonna give you a warning today, because you knew better. And uh and let me go talk to this guy. <laughs> That's how it's going to go. So it's kind of cover your ass. Always. You know. Always CYA. And, <laughs> you know, if it was just the bow stunt caps, I would probably walk to the bus next to me and take them off of that gun. Because <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, how many licenses do you have? One. One. Protect it fiercely. That's what I will say to that. And if it's something that's critical that can endanger someone's life, that gets into what we call the whistleblower protection program, or that law section, it's 29 CFR part 1978. No one can force you to operate an unsafe vehicle. Period, end of discussion, you can't bring any negative action against you in any way, shape, or form. So you always have to balance, what are we talking about? Is this a critical item? Is this a life-threatening situation? Is this just something that's gonna be a ticket? Where are we at with this? And then pick your battle, but always CYA, always document, always have signatures on the documentation. If it shows to be a routine problem, don't be afraid to have that person and then CC or let the person above them know. Don't be afraid to come back to the person that hired you and say, look, I got problems. You went through all this to hire me. Are you willing to lose me because I'm not giving up my license for it? Do you think that may gather a response? Yes. We're dealing with people everywhere we go and we have to navigate through this. But ultimately, you are responsible. Any other quick questions on that before I actually start talking about the detail part of the inspections now? Okay, so really, this should be pretty simple because we just kind of covered it. But you'll notice what I do is I teach them layers. I overcast, come back, hit another layer. So I'm trying to mentally put it back in. Pre-trip inspection, pre-trip inspection will help you find problems that occur or could cause a crash or breakdown during a trip. We already talked about that. For safety, you should watch your gauges. Use your senses, look, listen, smell, feel. Okay, you smell electrical fire burning? You may want to check that out, just saying. Um, mm -hmm. Critical, check critical items. Tires, wheels, rims, brakes, lights, uh, connections, cargo, all that stuff. You know, I've seen, uh, you could be operating buses. Um, some buses have the cargo doors on them. Sometimes you hit a bump with the latches and where the latch loosens up and you have a door that opens. I've seen the engine compartment doors open up on the back end of some of these. So, mm -hmm. again, you're always checking this stuff. <coughs> Don't assume anything. The uh, after trip inspection and report. Okay, legally, here's how the legal aspect goes. At the end of your tour of duty or end of your shift, that is when you would fill out an inspection report. It's a written report of things that are wrong with that vehicle. That has to be driver vehicle inspection report, DVIR. Okay, your post-trip bullet call it several names, but that's when that document plays out. We're good with that, everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Legally, that has to play out. And then, the next day when you come in, before you do your vehicle inspection, the first thing you do is you find that DVIR from the last driver. Mm -hmm. And if that was you or someone else, I don't care, but you read the report. Then you go out and you inspect your vehicle. If there was anything, notif notifications on that report, you need to sign that report as well. So let's say, let's say there was a tire that was flat. 
Okay, you see it noted on the report, tire was flat. Then you're gonna see where the shop repaired tire, they have to sign off on it. And then you're looking at that going, well, that driver said there was a flat tire, this mechanic said he fixed it, I'm gonna go out and inspect it. And then you go out, you check everything over, and at the end of that, you have to sign that report. Does that make sense, we're good with that? Mm -hmm. okay. I tell everybody sign the report anyway, because technically, according to the law, if there's nothing noted on that report, you don't have to sign it. I tell everybody sign it anyway. Why do you think I say that? You said it's a condition of inspection. Um, exactly. Shows, hey, I was there. I did it. Okay. All right, moving on. So there's the report. Um, after trip inspection report, you do a report at the end of the day. It may include filling out a report, which it will. Uh, the inspection report helps the motor carrier know when the vehicle needs repairs. What to look for? Okay. There are some technical things in here that you will need to know. There are some things you just should have like background knowledge. Say, okay, this is something that I should look at. If we go through this and there are any terms in here or any components that you do not understand what it is, let me know. Because I don't know what you don't know until then we're gonna try and get through this material because I have a lot of pages to cover that. Too much or too little air pressure. Um, this is buff tires here. Bad wear. Now you will need to note this is something you will need. This little bullet right here, you need to know that for your permit. You need to know it for your driving test. Which one did you say? The second one down, bad wear. So you need at least four thirty seconds of an inch tread on every major groove on the front tires. You need two thirty seconds of an inch on all the other tires. So your steer tires need four thirty seconds, four three two. All the other tires, two three two, two thirty seconds. <clears throat> No fabric can shelter from the tread or sidewall. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. Do they provide us the gauges? They have wear bars on the tires. Oh. So you can ask them if they provide you with the gauges. Um, it's not something I don't think we necessarily need because they do have the wear bars on them. Uh, generally, the uh, head of a dime is 230 seconds, the head of a penny is four. Okay. Cuts or other damage on them, tread separation, duels that come in contact with each other or other parts of the vehicle, mismatched tire sizes, uh, radial versus bias plate tires used together, cut or cracked valve stems, regrooved, recapped, or retreaded tires on the front wheels of a bus. So you have to have virgin tires on the front wheels. Those are all prohibited here. Okay. Wheel and rim problems. You can't have any damage to the rims. You can't have any uh, rust around the wheel nuts. That could mean that they're loose, check for tightness. After tires have been changed, stop a short while later and recheck the tightness of the lug nuts. Missing clamps, spacer studs, or lugs means danger. Mismatched, bent, or cracked lock rings are dangerous. Wheels or rims that have had welding repairs are also not safe. Any questions yet? We're still good? Moving on. Brake drum, or bad brake drums, or brake shoes. Cracked drums, you can't have that. Shoes or pads with oil, grease, or brake fluid on them. Uh, shoes worn dangerously thin, missing, or broken. Side note on that, quarter inch. That's the minimum uh, shoe you need. So that brace shoe, that's a quarter inch the minimum. And we're looking at those, it's actually a little wear line on them. Yes? Are they actually, are we, are we really checking this stuff? Yes. We're responsible for every part of that bus. Well, you, a lot of that's mechanical stuff that you can't see like without taking the wheel. Some of that is mechanical without taking the wheel off. Okay, well, some of it you can without taking the wheel off. Like brake shoes, you can. Mm -hmm. You know, unless they have a dust cover on them. If they have a dust cover on them, well, then you're not going to be able to see them without crawling underneath. Mm -hmm. But your steer tires, if they don't have dust covers on them, you should be able to see that. And your back tire, you should be able to see it. Because you can look underneath that bus and look across at the opposing side and see those brake shoes. And the brake shoes will have two in the top of the pad, they're gonna be split. There's two straight up areas and then it Ys off. When that wears down and that Y is gone, you're out of shoes, you're all done. Okay? I don't know how the maintenance program is here, I'm assuming it's a good maintenance program, but when in doubt, you're still responsible. Even if you look at the dust cover and go, okay, there it is. But if you have brake problems, I'll go talk to someone. But you have to make sure that that's operated. That's still your responsibility. Like we talked about with the cost of the medical card. Everything is your responsibility, even if that means talking to someone else and did they do it. It's still yours, okay? Any other questions on this stuff? So yeah, we're gonna get around these buses quite a bit. Yes, ma'am. If um, you inspect the bus and it's not up to par in um, service, 
Would you get another bug or do you have to look at that bug to be certain? That's going to be with your employer. That's not something they're going to be working with on the permit. But again, I'll go back to the statement I made of you only have one license. So make sure that regardless of how that works out, you know, it's safe. I mean, you didn't have to re inspect another bug on someone's license. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of it. And there are some companies out there that'll do the whole inspection for you. That, that's part of the old mechanic that constantly does this. And I'm good with that. So long as someone is doing it, you can account for that situation. And you know what, if you have to wait for your bus to be repaired, maybe that's the only bus they have, you're getting paid by the hour to sit there and wait for it then. You're still, it's a win-win, okay? But the bottom line for the permit part is make sure it's safe. Make sure all the stuff is accounted for, okay? Any other questions on this aspect? Okay, steering system defects, missing nuts, bolts, counter keys, or other parts. Bent loose or broken parts such as steering column, gearbox, or tie rods. Uh, if a power steering is equipped, check your hoses, your pumps, your fluid level, check for leaks, stuff like that. Steering wheel free play of more than 10 degrees, approximately two inches movement on a 20 inch wheel, make it hard to steer. That'll be a question on probably your test right there. Mm -hmm. How much free play you can have in a steering wheel? 10 degrees. 10 degrees is what you're after, 10 degrees. So on a 20 inch wheel, steering wheel, that's about two inches of movement. Do you think the DOT officer will measure that if he pulls you over? No. Oh yeah, he'll measure that all day long, folks. Do you think that DOT officer is gonna crawl underneath there and check those brake shoes out? Mm -hmm. All day long? All right. Now, <laughs> guys, it didn't work. It didn't work. There it is. Okay. <laughs> suspension, suspension defects. Suspension defects. <laughs> Spring hangers that allow movement of the axle proper position, that's a problem, okay? Cracked or broken leaf springs or spring hangers, uh, missing or broken leaves in any leaf spring, any defect could be dangerous. If any of the following conditions exist though, the vehicle would be placed out of service. So you should know these. I believe there's a question on the test they'll talk about the one fourth or more leaves missing. Know these three things right here, because they will twist that in at some point, because this is critical. One fourth or more of the leaves in any spring assembly are broken. Okay, that's out of service. Any leaf or portion of any leaf in any spring assembly missing or separated. And any main leaf in the leaf spring assembly is broken. The main leaf is the big leaf at the top that goes from one bracket to the next. The main big leaf, that's the issue. Uh, broken leaves in the multi-leaf spring or leaves that have shifted, so they might hit the tire, that's an issue. Leaking shock absorbers. Torque rods or arms, U bolts, spring hangers, or other uh, axle positioning parts that are cracked, damaged, or missing. Any air suspension systems that are damaged or leaking. And you lose cracked or broken, missing frame members. So you basically, anything that's cracked, broke, missing, bent, not good, loose, leaking, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Just understand the component, understand where the problem can exist in that. Okay, so there's your main leaf spring, that's what they're talking about there. There's your air suspension. So you can see how they have airbags in there on the back part of that axle, and again, softens it up. Those are the two suspension systems you'll be dealing with on commercial vehicles. Okay. We'll talk more about air later. Uh, exhaust system defects. Again, this is exhaust, folks. This stuff can kill you, right? Not good for you. So anything that's loose, broken, or missing, exhaust pipes, mufflers, tailpipes, vertical stacks, any loose, broken, or missing mounting brackets, clamps, bolts, or nuts. So if it's loose, it's an issue. Exhaust system parts rubbing against fuel system parts, tires, or other moving parts. You think that could be a problem? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Exhaust system parts that are leaking. The exhaust system's hot in case you didn't know it's hot, so if you touch it, it may burn you. Please be aware of that. Now, this will be on the test in every single endorsement when it comes to emergency equipment. Okay. Vehicles must be equipped with these three things. They have to have a fire extinguisher, fully charged and mounted, so you know. Spare electrical fuses, unless it's equipped with circuit breakers in the vehicle. So everybody understand the difference between the two. Circuit breaker will trip and then reset when it cools. Your fuses, when they blow, they blow and need to be replaced. Okay. Warning devices for parked vehicles. For example, three reflective warning triangles. That's standard issue, three reflective triangles. And they will ask this in every session. You need to know these three things, okay? Has anybody in here already taken the permit test? Okay. So you're seeing some of these questions coming through, right? 
-hmm. Okay, so by the way, if you've ever taken it recently, if you see something I've missed to, to say, by the way, just point that out to me. Okay, we'll work as a team. It's been probably, I don't know, 30 years since I took the permit test. So. <laughs> but, uh, but I do play with the practice test. Now, they had a seven-step inspection method. Here, here's what I will say to this in this book. It's not going to be questioned what is step one, what is step two, what is step three. It's not going to question like that. What they're going to be after is that you do the same routine inspection every time. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. So don't put as much weight on this. Do we need to do all this stuff? Yeah, but the order in which we do it in can be altered a little bit. So method of inspection, and this is the first thing, you want to highlight this, you should do a pre-trip inspection the same way each time so you will learn all the steps and be less likely to forget something. So the first thing we do is we look at the approach of the vehicle, general condition. Is it leaking something? Is it leaning? Is it tilting? What's the obvious coming up to it? Um, vehicle over your review. Remember we talked about doing the last report. We got to inspect that. That's in there. Check the engine. So we gotta check the engine oil level, coolant level, power steering fluid levels, windshield washer fluid levels, uh, battery fluid levels, uh, that you probably won't get into anymore, but the connections you tie down just so get into, make sure they're not leaking, stuff like that. Automatic transmission fluid level, again, that may not be something you have to check on yours. Check belts for tightness. Uh, again, there should be no cuts or frayed, it's rubber. Nothing cut, frayed, or worn, and no more than three quarters of an inch movement in there. Okay, you can write that in there next to it. I don't know if they're gonna ask you that on this, but on the road test they will. Three quarters of an inch is the maximum on belts. Mm -hmm. Any leaks in the engine compartment, fuel, oil, anything like that, any crack, worn, or electrical wiring mm -hmm. installations. Get in and start the engine, make sure the brake is on, make sure we're in neutral. Listen for any unusual noises. If equipped, check the anti-lock brake system, indicator lights. Everybody in here has ABS on their car, right? So we understand how that system works. So you turn the key on, before you start it, the light comes on, right? Then the light goes off. So we did a systems diagnostic. When all the system's good, that light goes back off. Okay, that's the way it is in commercial vehicles too. Same thing, turn the key on, the light comes on. You get it going, the light goes off. That, that's normal situation. If the ABS light comes on and stays on, does that mean we no longer have brakes on the vehicle? No, it just means we don't have ABS. We just don't have a computer doing braking with us, that's all. Is that something we should turn into the shop? Yeah. Yes, if you have an ABS light on, is that something that is a ticketable offense out in the DOT world? Yes, okay. So make sure that that's working. If it's not working properly, again, talk to your uh, shop. For trailers only, they shouldn't have this question on there because we're only dealing with buses, but understand Trailers have it too, they have their own system. And they put those lights on the driver's side, rear of the vehicle. Everybody understand that? Driver's side, rear. Same thing, you turn the key on, it'll start up, everything goes on, the light comes on, does its test, the light goes off, everything's good. That light comes on and stays on, that means your trailer doesn't have ABS. Okay. All right, look at the gauges, watch your oil, all your pressures, all your gauges. So oil pressure, air pressure, your voltmeter, and meter, your coolant temperature, engine oil temperature, and any warning lights and buzzers. Okay. Does everybody understand the color codes of the lights in your own car? Great, so if we have a light on the dash that comes on and it's yellow, is that critical? No, it's kind of a cautionary light, right? If you have a red light come on on your dashboard and stay on, is that something critical? Yeah. yeah. Same in these units, okay? Always make sure you understand that color coding. Gauges come up to normal. Um, check your condition of the controls. One more thing about gauges. Here's the thing. They're not gonna ask you specifics as to what pressure should be what. Okay? Just make sure the gauges are working. That's what they're after on this permit. Don't try and pass a road test today or tomorrow when you're doing this permit. Pass a permit. Okay? You are dealing with New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. You're dealing with engineers and people that wrote this test up that may or may not have known what they're talking about fully and understand fully what's going on in that vehicle. Think about that. You are passing a test based on this book and this knowledge. This stuff may vary slightly as you get out there in the field and they start saying, okay, now we're gonna train you for the road test. Now we're gonna train you on how we want you to drive. That may vary a little bit. Rules and regulations still stay the same. Okay. Just the mindset is what I'm after on this. Because if you try and 
pass the test based on, hey, I've been a driver for 20 years, you're probably gonna fail the permit test. <laughs> Check your condition of the controls, um, the steering wheel, clutch, accelerator, brake controls, transmission controls, interaxle differential locks if your vehicle has one. Um, what that interaxle differential lock is, is sometimes you'll see some of your, your tractors, your semis have two axles on them. A lot of those only drive on the front axle. And let's say you get stuck or start to spin, you can lock in the second axle so you have both axles pushing you. That's the interaxle lock, okay? Do we need to know that? No. no. Just knowledge, just put in the back of your head just in case they pop a question on it for some reason, which that happens. Because the general knowledge has to cover all commercial vehicles. So your inner axle differential lock, any horns, air horn, electrical horn, wipers and washers, all your lights have to work, all that good stuff. Check your mirrors and windshields. Again, nothing cracked, broken, illegal stickers, everything has to be adjusted. Make sure they're clean. Oh, here, safety equipment. Like we never saw that before. You see how critical this is, Tom? Make sure highlight those, make sure you know those three things. Spare electrical fuses three red reflective triangles and a properly charged array of fire station. Did you notice how they changed the wording a little bit and changed the order? This is all you're gonna see all through these tests. You'll see it in all three tests. Check for optional equipment, tire chains, uh, tire changing equipment, list of emergency phone numbers, and maybe an accident reporting kit, okay, depending on what you're operating. Uh, like in your buses, you may have a first aid kit, stuff like that. Just make sure all your kits are in place. Safety belt, again, make sure it's mounted properly. There's no cuts or frays in it. Operates, all that good stuff. Turn the engine off, go check your lights. Uh, make sure your four ways, well beams, all that. Do a walk around the vehicle. We're gonna basically talk here about check, changing your, or checking your lights, high beam, low beam, four ways, clearance lights, left turns, right turns, general walk around, uh, reflectors, all that have to be in place. Driver's door glass, latches, left front wheel. I'm skipping over a lot of this stuff rather quickly, and I'll slow down when I get to where I need it. Condition the vehicle and rim. We talked about that, no missing bent or broken studs. It's kind of a repetitive thing. Check the condition of the tires, properly inflated, valve stems, caps okay. Um, use a wrench to test rusted, rust streak, lug nuts indicating looseness. That's something that, again, this is a great example, something that's in the permit book. You need to know that. You get to the company here, and they're gonna say, we're not giving you a wrench, we want you touching it. Talk to the mechanic. The mechanic will come out with the wrench and touch it. You see how this is going to alter a little bit? That's why I said when you're going down there to pass this permit, understand the book. Understand what they're asking of you. Now what this company is asking, now what any other company may be asking, what do they want to see for an answer? That's two different things. Hub oil level is okay and no leaks. Any component that we've talked about yet that you don't understand what it is, great. What's the hub? Okay, so the word says check hub oil level. Do you understand what it means? Can you describe it for me? Uh, no. Okay, how about you? Uh, that means it can close the hood. Okay, can you describe it? <laughs> See, I'm catching you now. Yeah. See? So let me go through. I'm just sorry. Just okay. Don't worry, I'll, I'll pick on the second one. Next. I'm very methodical. I share it equally. Now, your front wheel is going around. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Very simple idea. Your axle that holds that wheel on there does not. So at some point where that mouse for the axle, the wheel's going around, we have to put bearings between the wheel and that axle that's sitting still, okay? Two ways to lubricate that. You either pack that full of grease, and we have a grease pack hub, which would just be a cover on top of that, or we'll put it through an oil bath. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna have 80 or 90 gear weight oil in there, heavy oil. The, the hub will have a little bit of clearness to it that you can look through and see the oil level in there. And if you can't see the oil level, you pull the little rubber stopper out of the center and you stick your finger in there. But if that does not have oil in it, what will happen to the bearings? Lock up. Lock up. And they can get very hot, right? Mm -hmm. If they get very hot and it's next to oil, what can the oil do? Start on fire. You see where this goes wrong? And if we lose all those bearings, where does the wheel go? The wheel takes off and leaves. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a bad day at work. We don't want that. So, when it says hub oil level okay and no leaks, that's kind of an important thing. You shouldn't have to ever have to add oil to these. You always check them on level ground because we're checking fluid. 
If there's any issues in that area, you talk to your mechanic immediately, don't operate the vehicle. Because this is not consuming oil, this is not burning oil. If you have low oil, it's going somewhere, okay? And you probably need new bearings or something going on or the mechanic needs to come out right now and fix, okay? That's kind of a critical item. Okay, left front suspension, uh, condition of the spring, spring hanger, shackles, U-bolts, shock absorbers, stuff like that. Condition of the brakes, this drum, condition of hoses. Any questions? So we're good with the parts yet? You're paying attention now, right? Mm -hmm. calling, mm -hmm. yeah. You don't know who I'm calling now. Front tire, condition of the front axle, condition of the steering system. Um, again, no, nothing loose, bent, cracked, broken. Windshield, we talked about that. Reflectors, lights. Um, I'm just gonna skim over a lot of this stuff. Um, secondary, cab stuff, locks and gauge, fuel tanks, three things on any liquid tank, fuel tank. Cap, straps, leaks. Is the cap tight? Is it strapped to the vehicle properly? Are there any leaks underneath? Always on every single tank, okay? Visible parts, transmission, make sure it's not leaking in engine. We're just looking for leaks anywhere. You start seeing something get moisture to it, write it up. Okay, because a little moisture starting somewhere turns into what? A lot of moisture somewhere, uh, which turns into what? A bad day at work, okay? These are the things we look for. Um, frame, cross members, again, nothing damaged with that. Cargo securement, you're not gonna get into any set. Cargo securement really issues, um, but just understand if it's anything to do with cargo, it has to be secured, it can't bounce around, it has to be you know, centered and balanced, all that good stuff. Think about putting a, a bag of salt in the center of your car, or putting groceries in the back seat of your car, okay? It's simple things. Okay. Maybe this one will work better. Maybe a bottle of wine in the back seat of your car. Mm -hmm. That needs to be secured down. I understand that, right? Because if you have an accident, what's going to happen with that? Ah, you got it. So now you understand cargo. Moving on. Right rear, again, the condition of wheels, tires. You see how a lot of this becomes repetitive now. Yeah. And that's why I'm skimming through a lot of the book, because once you understand the parts, every angle that we go around this vehicle, regardless of where we're going or the direction or the order, we're still checking all the parts. Okay. Splash guard, you have to add that. Uh, license plate, stuff like that. License plate light. Any tailgates, any parts, any of that stuff. Um, battery boxes, again, make sure they're secured down. Nothing leaking, bouncing around in there. Turn signals, brake lights. Start the engine. You will need to know step seven, though. Step seven, you will need to highlight. You need to know this for the test, I guarantee it. When you are in general knowledge, Assume you are in a hydraulic brake vehicle. That's equal to basically what you have in your car. That is what we go with. Do not jump down the barrel of an air brake vehicle. Don't do that. Hydraulics. And that's in general knowledge. If we're going to ask an air brake, air brake question, it will be in the air brake endorsement area. Now, how do we test hydraulic brakes for leaks? How do you test your car for, for leaks, folks? We should know this, right? Mm -hmm. Have the engine running, right? Because mm -hmm. we need the pumps running, everything running. We pump that pedal three times, right? Mm -hmm. On the third time, we hold it for five seconds. If that pedal moves and goes to the floor, are we okay? No. Mm -hmm. Nope. We're done right there. Should we just be gentle on our brakes testing them? Mm -hmm. No. Hit them like that, that dog just ran out in front of you type pedal. That's what we're going to do. Because if you want, I have a brake line, that's borderline compromised, you want it to blow while you're sitting in your parking lot, your driveway, or wherever you are, while the vehicle stops. That's a good place to blow. I've had some students come through and go, my brake lines aren't so good. I don't think I should really hit them like that. There's your sign, okay? Because when you that something runs out in front of you, you don't want it to break at that time. So any questions on this? If the vehicle has hydraulic brakes, pump the pedal three times, and then apply firm pressure to the pedal and hold for five seconds. The pedal should not move. If it does, it could be a problem to get it fixed. That will be on the test. Any questions? No. Moving on. <laughs> okay, brake system. Test the parking brake. We need to make sure our parking brake works. Okay? So we would apply the parking brake and, and simple things, fasten your seat belt, stuff like that. All we're doing is we're putting the parking brake on, we're putting the vehicle into gear, and putting a little pressure on it. Does the parking brake hold? That's it. We're not going down the road 50 feet and throwing the brake on. No, we pull the brake, we just give it a little time, make sure it holds in place, okay? That's how we test the parking brake. Will that be on the test? 
Yep, and it's going to be on your road test too. Now, test of service brakes. This is one where we go forwards. What's the difference between service and parking? Do you understand? Do you understand? The service is when a driver moves it. Okay. So the parking brake system holds the vehicle in place, parks somewhere. Okay. So that's parking. The service, the service, it's doing you a service. So when you go down the road and you're trying to slow the vehicle, you want a brake that will service your command. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's your brake pedal. So that's a service brake. Are we understand that now? Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of keep that term related, that will help you when you get to air brakes. Okay. So we're gonna test the service brakes. So we're gonna put our vehicle in gear now. We're gonna go about five miles an hour. We're just gonna stop the vehicle, like we're stopping for a stop sign. Did the vehicle stop, yes or no? Did the vehicle pull left? Did it pull right? Was there any issues with those brakes? Okay, that's when we'll find that. Everybody understand this? Mm -hmm. Again, this will be in this section, the air brake section, it'll be in your passenger section, and it'll be on your road test. Mm -hmm. You need to know this, this all the way through. Here's a little clue. Anytime you see something in a box like this on the permit book, mm -hmm. it will be on the test. Guaranteed. So anything in a box like that, highlight it. If you find anything unsafe during a pre-trip inspection, get it fixed. Federal and state laws forbid operating an unsafe vehicle. Okay? Any place you see this. So if we skim through this and I miss telling you that, three pages off, highlight it because it's in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we do page nine. We're running out of time. Not bad. About 10 minutes out. I'm going to take a quick break. Inspection during a trip. Um, check the instruments, gauges, all that stuff during the trip. Really, we've already talked about a lot of this stuff. Uh, drivers of trucks and truck tractors. So really, this is, isn't really going to pertain to your bus scenario. But when we're checking freight, okay, if we're hauling freight, you need to stop within the first 50 miles to check your freight. And then every 50 or 150 miles or three hours after that, whichever comes first. Even though you're going for bus and it won't be pertinent to you, in general knowledge, they will ask this question, okay? So you do need to know if you're hauling freight, you have to stop and check that freight within the first 50 miles. And then in every three hours or 150 miles after that, we need to check it again. If it's adverse conditions, we would stop every two hours or 100 miles. So you see how the numbers go one hour, two hour, three hours? 50 miles, 100 miles, 150. First trip, adverse conditions, normal routine. Make sense? 50, 150. 50, 100, 150. Okay. So every, that's how we do those increments. That's how you can lock that in your head because they will twist this all different ways on these permit tests. As long as you understand that, you'll get thrown. After trip inspection and report, do I need to talk more about that? No. Moving on. Basic control of your vehicle, accelerating, steering, stopping, and backing safely. Those are things that uh, this section is going to talk about. Let me sum this up very quickly. Everybody here drives a car, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We need to control all of these, don't we? Right. Don't make this something it's not. So many people will come through here and they go, oh my God, it's a CDL, and they get overwhelmed because they're trying to add a bunch of new information. Translate this into something you already know. You know, acceleration. You know, if you step on the gas too hard and it's slippery, oh, what's going to happen? How do we stop that? Get to put off the accelerator. Basically, whatever cost it, stop doing it. We all know that if the vehicle goes into a skid, we steer into the skid, right? We all know that you don't hit a brake during a skid, right? So we understand that you don't pump them, you don't touch a brake, you just ride it through. Yeah. That's what we do. So when it comes to accelerating, we take off from a traffic light, nice and easy, right? If it's slippery conditions, we have to be a little bit gentler. Steering, should we be aggressive on our steering? Yeah. No, we know this, right? So same in these, be gentle on the steering. Generally when you're doing lane changes, if you're having a problem doing lane changes, pick your vision up farther. The further you pick your vision up, it'll make those lane changes nice and smooth, okay? Let's talk about uh, steering when it's an issue though. If you're making a turn on these commercial vehicles, even in your car, if you make a turn on slippery conditions, 
what are the chances of the front wheels going into a skid? High or low? It's high, folks. Okay? Because the vehicle will have a tendency to try and push forward as those front wheels skid. That's why commercial vehicles, when we come into these turns, we come into the turns nice and slow so those front tires have time to grip. Okay? Stopping, saving your car, you just jam on the brake pedal. Okay, and I will tell you this, there are probably some people in here that have problems driving the cars. If your passengers are grabbing the oh crap handle, it's the driver's problem, not the passenger's problem, okay? If you're bracing yourself against the seats for turns, it may be, maybe the driver's issue here. Um, you know, I have the pop bottle theory when it comes to these three things. You should be able to take a pop bottle or water bottle, make sure the cap's on, set it on your floorboard. You should be able to drive everywhere and never knock that bottle over. Okay, you wanna to learn to drive a bus, that's the best way to learn it. Because your passengers are feeling that. And the reason I teach that in commercial with freight is because if the pop bottle falls over, your freight falls over. So get used to that now. That's a good way for you to start wearing in a little bit. Backing safely, okay. There's a get out and look thing that they're teaching very strongly on that. Get out and look before you back up. They don't want you backing over things, especially the commercial vehicle because you can't see behind you a lot of times. Uh, as a matter of fact, we try very hard to avoid backing. The first thing you need to know about backing is don't do it, okay? So if we can get into a position where we can pull out, that's our first option. After that, it deteriorates. Then we get into straight lines, then we get into seaside, then we get into bumpers. It's just a list that we'll get into. Any questions on these four things? Now I'm gonna go a little bit faster because I'm gonna just rush through these now because we understand them. Don't overthink this. When it comes to accelerating, don't roll back when you take off, especially if you have a manual transmission. I believe we've got an all automatics here, so it's not really even an issue. Um, but even on the automatics, make sure that you know we're, we're not rolling backwards anywhere. We never wanna roll forwards or backwards at any intersection or any place. Speed up smoothly and gradually. Uh, if you lose traction, just back off a little bit. Hold the steering wheel firmly. Where do we hold the steering wheel? Nine and three, folks. In your car, it's what? Two and ten. Ten and two, right? Yep. In the buses, commercial vehicles, it's nine and three. It's a bigger lever, better leverage. You always want a push and pull scenario. You never want a twist scenario. Okay, the uh, stopping, push and brake coming down gradually. We've already talked about that. When it comes up to that stop, you're just about to stop. Remember, in your car, you back off that brake a little bit, right? Same thing here. Backing safety. Uh, because you can't see everything behind you, your vehicle backing is always dangerous. Avoid backing whenever you can. That'll probably be on the test, folks. This backing thing will be on the test. This causes a ton of accidents in the industry, in every industry. So avoid backing whenever you can. That's priority number one. When you park, try to pull so you can pull straight out when you leave. If you do have to back up one, start in the proper position. Make sure you kind of pull so you can back straight up. Look at your path, use your mirrors on both sides and back up slowly, okay? You back up nice and slow, you probably do less damage, you probably you know, have a chance for someone to yell stop. Back and turn towards the driver's side whenever possible, and then use a helper whenever possible. Everybody understand that? They will ask that on the test, use a helper. Okay. So you really should know this little section underneath the bullet here in backing. That they will ask, they're gonna get into this. Again, it's kind of their priority thing here. We talked about starting in the proper position. We've already talked about looking at the path, overhead, all that stuff, using mirrors on both sides. We talked about that. Backing slowly, we talked about that. Any questions? Am I going too fast? Great, moving on. Back, turn towards the driver's side. So the first thing we do is go straight back. If we can't do that, then we back up towards the driver's side, not because we see better in the mirror, but because we can look right out the driver's side window or door. That's why we back to the driver's side. Plus, the driver's side mirror is closer to you. We just have better visibility overall. Make sense? Backing to the blind side or the passenger side, that's dangerous because one, the mirror's further away from us. Two, we have all of this blind section that we can't see. It's much harder to back that direction. Therefore, since it's harder, it's more dangerous. So we try to pick how we do things, even if we have to drive around the block to set up properly for a back end. Um, and they'll talk about this here, what their regulations are, what their protocol is for backing up. And I'm assuming most of their backing here is going to be very, very minimal, especially with passengers on board. Use a helper whenever you can. Where do you want the helper to? Where do you want the helper to stand? Yes, driver's side or passenger side. Driver's side near the back of the vehicle. 
they should stay in your sight at all times. If they move out of your sight, what do you do? Uh -huh. Exactly. What is the number one hand signal to establish with your helper? Stop. That's exactly right. And they'll sit, that's the last sentence right here. Before you begin backing, work out a set of hand signals that both of you understand and agree on the signal for stop. That will be on the test. Do I keep standing in your way? Can you see okay? Okay. I'm just figuring that out. Two hours in, good time, right? Shifting gears, again, we're not gonna have to really get into gears on the bus, but you still need to know a little bit about it because they may ask you that on the test. Okay, so we'll still cover it a little bit. Correct shifting of gears is very important. Uh, if you lose gears going down the hill, it can be very dangerous very quickly. So when it comes to manual transmissions, we use what we call double clutching. So what we do is we clutch twice. Basically what is what's happening here is in your cars and pickups, you have a synchronized transmission. It means you push on the clutch all the way down, you move the lever and all the sinkers in the transmission line everything up for you, you have to do nothing. Give it a second, it falls in gear. In the commercial industry, in non-synchronized transmission, you have to synchronize the input shaft versus the gear versus the road speed. So what happens is we would push in the clutch, bring the lever to neutral, line up the RPMs, push in the clutch, bring it into the next gear. Okay, it's normally four to 600 RPM variance per gear, and we, that takes a little bit of time, a little bit of practice, okay? We're not getting into that in this program, but I wanna make sure you understand for this permit. So using double clutching means you would use the same clutch pedal twice, okay? If it's not two clutches in there, you use the same clutch pedal, shift it twice. Okay, and then for downshifting, um, you would rev the engine in the middle of that because we're changing the RPMs in the opposite direction. So you shift it to neutral, increase your RPMs, and then shift to the next gear down because the lower gear is traveling at a higher speed. Okay. Um, Let's see, knowing when to shift up, knowing when to shift up, there's two real ways that they're gonna stay here shifting up. One is using engine speed, the RPMs. Listen to the engine, is the engine running fast or slow for patients? And the other is road speed, okay? What gear is good for what road speed? These will be the questions that they're gonna ask you on that permit test, okay? Just know when to shift up. There's your shift, uh, down shifting procedures. Now, here's the thing that they really are truly after when it comes to downshifting. And this is the question that they will ask because this is the dangerous point. Downshifting, like upshifting, requires knowing when to shift, okay? So there are times when we need to downshift. The key to remember when it comes to downshifting, before. Before anything, before everything. So before the hill, before we crest it, before the curve, before we get to the stop, before, before, before. If there's a problem, get it done before you get there. It's always before. So when you go to your answers and you get your process of elimination going on in the test, and they say, when should you start downshifting for a, a, a hill, after the grade, after you crest it, after you're halfway down it, or before you start? There you go, you see what I'm talking about? Understand what they're after with this because they're really, all the way through the test, it's about safety. What is the most dangerous thing and how do we avoid that danger? That's really what they're after. Any questions on that? Curves, why would we downshift before a curve and not in it? Exactly, we're slowing down before. Yeah. And when you go through a curve, if you drove a motorcycle or anything like that, even in cars, you want a slight acceleration coming through that curve, okay? It's momentum. Now you're gonna be driving buses or top heavy vehicles. When we are going through a curve, you have centrifugal force taking the top of that vehicle outwards in the curve, right? Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. If you brake or let off the throttle or are deaccelerating, that outward momentum is increasing. We're, we're losing to that force. If we step on the throttle, we change that momentum back to a forward momentum instead. So we counter that sideways momentum by using forward momentum. Very good with that, you understand? So you, so you press the gas. You You'd step on the gas, yep. Don't do like this. Don't stop. hit the brake going through. And the key to this whole thing is do it before the curve. Okay. Slow to a safe speed before the curve. If you're in the curve and you're going way too fast, we got problems. Yeah. This is gonna go bad no matter what you did. Gust of wind, we just had high winds the other day, right? Gust of wind hits you from the side. Should you step on the gas or let off? If 
if you let off, what momentum just won? Go push it. Sideward's momentum wins. So if you don't want the sideward's momentum to win, which one do you do? Push it. Step on the gas. Anytime you think about wind, think about a sheet of plywood and you. If you take a sheet of plywood in the wind and you just let off, where are you going? You're going with it. You have to counter that with your momentum. That's how we get through it. And that comes up later in the section here. So just understand that. Any questions about the downshifting stuff or any of that? Automatic transmissions. Now, there may be a question here. Can you downshift an automatic transmission? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely you can. When should you do it? Before. Okay. So we're a lot of city driving in this area, or a lot of flat lane driving in this area, which is fine. I live more out towards where there's hills. So if I'm going down uh, adverse hill, adverse road conditions, I may downshift my vehicle into the third or second gear, or depending on the grade, maybe in the first gear, and that will hold that transmission in first gear and keep that vehicle at a slow speed going down the hill all on its own. That's why we would downshift that. Okay? It's all about vehicle control. Can it be done? Yes. Okay? But you would always do it before. Retarders, retarders are basically there to help slow the vehicle, not stop the vehicle. That's the thing that they're gonna be there. The cautionary here is really what you need to know. When your drive wheels have poor traction, the retarder may cause them to skid, therefore you should turn off the retarder whenever the road is wet, icy, or snow covered. Let me talk about retarders. Four different types of retarders in here. Um, they're listed right here, exhaust, engine, hydraulic, and electric. Basically, they're trying to slow the engine, or slow the driveline is what's happening. But, because we're only slowing the engine or the driveline, only the drive tires are being slowed down with this. That's why if we slow those down too rapidly, we go into a skid. Just like your car. If you take your car, put it on the snow, drop it into second gear, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to start doing this, right? Same thing with this. Now the exhaust, that basically puts the back pressure, buffles the exhaust pressure, puts the back pressure on the engine, retards the engine a little bit. It's like having a plugged exhaust and it'll slow you down. Engine retarder, they basically change the timing and alter the timing on the engine that it turns itself into an air compressor. Those are the ones you're hearing on the big trucks, the burp, 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 burps, that's that. Hydraulic, hydraulic is in the transmission, uses hydraulic pressure and fluid to run backwards against that drive line as it's trying to rotate. The electric uh, basically goes on the drive shaft, they put magnets on the drive shaft with a big magnet around it and try to make it go the opposite direction via the magnetic fields. Any questions on retarders? Okay, we are now at about eight minutes after seven. Let's take another quick break. Um, try and get back in here as quick as you can. I'd say five to 10 minutes most. Okay, yes, sir. Fantastic, let's get into it. We got about uh, 45 minutes or so left. We can tolerate me for that, we're good. All right. And if this keeps popping up, <laughs> Anybody knows that solution? Please stay after the class. Check the brake. Yes, indeed. Okay, so there's our questions. Let's talk about steam. Okay, when it comes to steam, circle this thing or highlight this. To be a safe driver, you need to know what's going on all around your vehicle. Not looking properly is a major cause of accidents. So now we're gonna get into where to look. You should be looking to the front, to the sides, to the rear, above and below, folks. Six different directions, right? You can all count that? How many of you actually do that driving down the road? Truly. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm gonna follow you. We're gonna see if you can see me. Never watch behind you. A lot of people don't. They just don't. But just understand how this is right. There you go. <coughs> so just understand in this industry, folks, it's critical that we know everything going on around us. You are the professional of the road. Okay? And, and with that, you need to be the first one to see the emergency vehicles, the first one to see something coming down tree limbs, stuff like that. We need to be ahead of the game, not behind the game. That's all there is to it. This isn't a hard job, it's just knowing what to look for. If you look in the right spot, you get the right answer. If you look in the wrong spot, you'll never get the right answer, okay? So moving on, seeing ahead, all drivers look ahead, but many don't look far enough ahead, okay? Yep, think about how you learn how to drive. 
first, if you can remember this, the first time you started driving, where did you really look? How far down the road? I looked at the hood of the vehicle myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I hit that hole. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> then we got a little more confident. What happened to our vision? Yeah, it picked up a little bit, didn't it? Uh-huh. It picked up a little further. The more confident we got, the faster we went. Keeps on going, but guess what? Generally didn't happen a whole lot. Anything out of this field of vision here just probably didn't happen. Okay? So that means most people aren't looking left and right as they're driving down the road. Most people aren't looking behind them. They're not looking at intersections left and right when they go through. They're not getting that head movement. They're not looking up. Okay, when I was in trucking, I drove to New York City a lot. A lot of Jersey City. You drive in that area, do you think you should be looking up at those buildings? Yeah, people throw things out of those windows all the time, folks. Okay? <laughs> Fights happen. Things happen out there. Next thing you know, some guy's junk is coming out that window. You have to look. If you don't look, there's no right? <coughs> so far enough ahead, because stopping or changing lanes can take a lot of distance, knowing what the traffic is doing on all sides of you is very important. You need to look well ahead to make sure you have room to make these moves. That's another reason. Stopping distance on these vehicles takes a long time. Fully loaded tractor trailer for a little over 500 feet with air brakes. Okay? We'll get into those numbers. Don't worry about that at the moment. Okay? But just know that this will take twice as long to stop as your car. Your car stops in 228 feet at 55 mile an hour. Okay? So think about that. A straight truck is going to be about 451. Add air brakes to that, and a tractor trailer, we're about 515 to roll. That's a lot. That means, and here's how I look at it, anything within 500 feet of the front of my vehicle, I call it a kill zone, because I'm going to kill it. I can't stop. Does that make sense? Think about a train. Can a train stop quickly? No. Absolutely not. So we can't stop quickly either. That means our field of vision has to be way out there. Okay? That's our normal. And that's where we just talked about where we were looking. Now we just have to prep that and bring that up a little bit further and we fall into a much easier category. How far ahead to look? This will be on the test. Remember, anything in the box will be on the test. How far ahead to look? Most good drivers look at least 12 to 15 seconds ahead. Okay? That equals, okay, city driving. That 12 to 15 seconds in city driving is about one city block. If you're driving on the open highway, that's about a quarter of a mile. Every information, all the information in that box, figure two six, you need to know. That'll be on the test. Guarantee it. So highlight that box if you got it covered. Okay, if you're not looking far enough ahead, you may have to stop too quickly, make quick lane changes and can't do it. Good drivers, here's something you want to highlight right here. Good drivers shift their attention back and forth, near and far. That's another statement that they will ask you on that test. So we have to keep that head moving. So should we focus on the mirror for, you know, 30, 40 seconds at a time? Okay, so should we stare at that person standing on their porch with no clothes on for like 30 seconds going, what? Okay, that was funny, right? That's good. What about the accident scene? Think about the accident scene. We've all seen them, right? We got what we call rubber necking, right? My God. Oh, nowadays, right? What do we do? The cell phone thing? Right? Understand how dangerous this is now. In a commercial vehicle, that's really dangerous. Okay? So pay attention to this. Make sure that we're looking 12 to 15 seconds. Make sure we keep our vision moving around, front, back, side, side. Keep that thing moving. Look for traffic. Look for vehicles coming onto the highway in your lane or turning. Watch for brake lights or uh, slow moving vehicles. By seeing these things far enough ahead, you can change your speed or change lanes to avoid a problem. Look for road conditions, hills, curves, signs, signals, all that stuff. Slow down and be ready to stop. Now, seeing directly in front of a large commercial vehicle, this may be a question on the test. This is kind of new within the last six years, seven years, they put this in the book. To reduce driver blind spots directly in front of large commercial vehicles, a New York State registered truck tractor, tractor trailer, or semi-trailer combination vehicle with gross vehicle weight rating of 26,000 pounds or more, and a conventional cab, which means that's the one with the nose in front of the truck, okay? 
where more than half of the engine length is forward to the foremost point of the windshield. Again, that's the big truck there. And steering wheel hub is in the forward quarter of the vehicle. Must be equipped with a convex mirror on the front of the vehicle whenever it is operated within a New York City or with a population of one million or more, which I believe there's only, it's just the five boroughs that have a population more than that, correct? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's uh, Rochester, Buffalo, or I don't think they need that Syracuse. I don't think they need the population. But when you're in that big city, this is what they want. The mirror must be adjusted so the driver can see all points of a horizontal line, three feet above the road, and one foot in front of the vehicle, across the full width of the front of the vehicle. So we have to be able to see right in the bottom front of our vehicle. Why do you think we have to do that? <coughs> Kids, people in wheelchairs, pets, all sorts of things. You come to a stop, let's say you're down in Manhattan, you come to a stop, it's a lot of activity there, right? Do you think you can record it and take it all in? Probably not so much. That's why we need that mirror there, that's law now. Just know it's a foot in front of your vehicle and three feet off the ground, that full width of the front of the vehicle. Just make sure that no one's there before we take off from the stop because there have been incidences where we've pushed wheelchairs down the road. Mm -hmm. We ran people over, hanging out in the front of the truck. It's happened, okay? Any questions on this regulation here? Okay, you'll need to know that regulation. Seeing to the sides and the rear, uh, it's important to know what's going around behind and to the sides. Check your mirrors regularly. Check more often in special situations. Make sure they're adjusted properly. Do regular checks. Check for traffic in the mirrors. Check your vehicle in the mirrors. Special situations, again, changing lanes, turns, merges, tight maneuvers. Don't lose what you already know in your car. If you do a lane change in your car, what should you look in? And if we're going to be doing a lane change to the left, what else do we do? We look. Okay, think about this, it's all the same. When we're making a turn, we should be looking at our mirror, know what's going on. Now we have a longer vehicle, so we're gonna require a little bit more looking. Okay, because we wanna make sure all the vehicles coming around with us. So don't let these get in your head. Just know that you're already doing them and you have to make sure you're doing them on a commercial vehicle. <laughs> just a little bit better job at it, okay? Turns, merges, stuff like that, tight maneuvers. Okay, anytime you're driving in close quarters, check your mirrors more often, make sure you have enough clearance. Again, that's trying to make the turns with these vehicles, check the mirrors, watch where the wheels and the vehicle is sitting, uh, tail swings and stuff like that. How do you use the mirrors? We kind of already talked about that. Manny. We use mirrors correctly by checking them quickly and understanding what you see. If you're staring in a mirror for quite a few seconds at a time, you're traveling a long ways down the road and not seeing anything, okay? Now, when you use your mirrors while driving on the road, check quickly, look back and forth between the mirrors and the road ahead, don't focus on the mirrors. Um, many vehicles, this would be a question here, the many large vehicles have curved convex fisheye fog eye and spot mirrors that show a wider area than flat mirrors. It's often helpful, but, and you need to highlight this, everything appears smaller in a convex mirror than it would if you're looking at it directly. Things also seem farther away than what they really are. Mm -hmm. You will need to know this for the permit part, okay? This is kind of a serious thing. Because when you look in that convex, it's gonna give you more vision, but it's that small mirror. Some of your cars have that. You look on the passenger side, you remember it has a distorted thing. You ever seen those? And they'll stay right at the bottom. Things may seem smaller and further away than what they really are. Same thing, except those are our convex mirrors. Mm -hmm. okay. Communication. Signal your intentions. Other drivers can't know what you're going to do until you tell them. Vehicle communication is important. Some of you may not be too good at that right now. Some of you may think your turning signal is a wedge. It is not, okay? It's communication. Let people know what we're trying to do. They can help you get in. So we use our uh, signaling turns. Uh, there are three good rules for using turn signals. You'll need to know these three. They will question you on this. These three, you need to signal early, signal continuously, then make sure you cancel your signal. That last one is one you ought to get used to. Most of the signals on these commercial vehicles do not self-cancel. We make our turn and then we cancel the signal ourselves. So we turn it on, we do execute our turn, when we're done with the turn, we execute and shut it off. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Lane changes, put your signal on before the lane changes. Um, change lanes slowly. Slowing down, okay. When you're slowing down, we would use our, our four ways or turn signals we're ever gonna use. 
Warn drivers behind you when you'll see you need to slow down. If you like taps on the brake pedal, let me talk about that. That will be on the test, okay? That is not playing games with someone. Please do not misinterpret this information and put this with tailgaters, okay? If you have a tailgater, we don't flash brake lights. We don't, none of this stuff. We don't play games. That's not a situation there. We're talking about coming, picturing, driving down the thruway, 65 mile an hour, you see the sea of red lights. We've all seen this, right? You look down the road going, oh, right? We start slowing down. In a commercial vehicle, we are a hazard. People can't see past us a lot of times. So what we're just gonna do is tap those brake pedals at just a little bit, not changing speed, just to flash those lights a little bit. Why do we do that? What, what's the importance of that? Mm -hmm. Gives them warning, but what else are we counting? Let's just know we're stopping, but there's something critical. What happens is people get road hypnotized. They get hypnotism. They get road hypnotized, it's called. So they're driving down the road, they get complacent. We've all done it. You're driving down the road, next thing you you step back, going, oh yeah, where am I? Right? So this happens when people have been traveling down those expressways and long roads for long periods of time. Flashing the brake lights snaps them out of that hypnotism, snaps them back into reality, brings them back into the moment. Now they're paying attention to you and they're paying attention to the driver. You just reduced the chance of an accident and get rear-ended. That's why we do this. And again, this is not changing speed. So we have tap our brake lights just to, to let people know. And then enough to flash the brake lights, you should warn following drivers. Use the four emergency flashers for times when you're driving very slowly or stop. Threshold on that's normally 15 mile an hour. So if we are doing more than 15 mile an hour underneath the posted speed or underneath the general flow of traffic, use your four ways. So if we're in the 65, we, we see traffic ahead is coming to a stop or slowing. My speedometer gets down 15, which would be what, 50? If I did my math right, by 50 mile an hour, what's coming on? My four ways. Mm -hmm. So picture following me. I'm the commercial driver. Picture following me. You... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's on. It's on. No. No. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> so anyway, picture that. You see the truck, I'm the truck in front of you. You see my lights tap a couple times for my brake lights. All of a sudden I'm reducing speed and then my four ways come on. You can't see a single thing in front of me. What do you know is going to happen though? I'm probably coming to a stop. We're probably coming into slow traffic. It's something going on. And if you're a good driver, what will you do with your following distance to me? You're going to stay back. You're going to increase your following distance. You're prepared now for the situation. Mm -hmm. And if we communicate this properly, everybody gets prepared. We avoid massive pileups. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is all about communication. So trouble ahead. When we come into turns, most drivers don't know how slowly you have to go to make a turn. So be cautious of that signal ahead. If you have to alter your vehicle position in the lane, make sure we're aware of that. Stopping on the road. Trucks and bus drivers sometimes stop in the roadway to unload cars where passengers are stopped at railroad crossings. Again, warn following drivers by flashing the brake lights and don't stop suddenly, okay? Driving slowly, drivers often do realize how fast they're going catching up to the slow vehicles. Again, if we're going up hills, stuff like that, wherever it's legal to do so, your speed gets below 15 or 15 under the speed limit, use your four ways. You're going up a long, steep hill, you got a heavy vehicle, 55 mile an hour, we get down to 40, kick on those four ways. That's number one, right? What's that? That's number one, four ways? Uh, yeah, I mean, you flash your brake lights if you're on the, the flat ground. Yeah. But if you're going up the hill, stuff like that, you're gonna be slow, use your four ways. Okay, okay so it's kind of like tap brake lights first if you need to, and then four ways, and as we keep slowing down, we're just trying to gradually slow that vehicle down. Rapid change in speed is what causes accidents. So all of this, we're trying to communicate, 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 and slow down. Communicating your presence, other drivers may not notice your vehicle, even when it's in plain sight, to help prevent accidents, let them know you're there. Okay, so when you're passing, when you're about to pass a vehicle, pedestrian, bicyclists, assume they don't see you, okay? Uh, when it's legal, maybe tap the horn slightly, or uh, it might maybe flash your lights from low to high beam and back. Let me make a statement about this. One, tapping your horn. We're not talking the air horn, we're talking the city horn. Two, if that's going to cause a problem, be very careful with that. Use that cautiously. But sometimes like the mailman, right? You see the mailman, mailbox, mailbox, mailbox. They get complacent with traffic. Sometimes just a little tap, even on the air horn maybe, let them know, hey, we're here. That way they're paying attention to us, we're paying attention to them, our chance of an accident just diminished. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. You get that 10-year-old on a bicycle though, 
you tap the air horn, you tap a horn, what are they going to do? <laughs> Manage this. It's communication that we're talking about, you have to think. And a lot of you think about this for a second. You already knew this, right? A lot of you knew the answer to these questions. So in this whole learning thing, getting the permit, don't make it something that's not. Most of you already know a lot of this stuff, okay? When passing the headlights, high to low beam, it is illegal to flash your high beams or have your high beams on within 500 feet of any other vehicle. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. 500 feet, okay? So when they're saying to flash your high beams, I would say under the right circumstance. Okay, you got, uh, maybe it's daytime, you're flashing them. Maybe they're down the road a little ways, fine, give them a little flash. To me, that's not my priority, it's normally gonna be the other one, but on the question on the permit test, because remember, we're talking permit, not real world. This is what they're looking for. They're looking for flashing lights, tap the horn, communicate. That's what they're looking for. When it's hard to see, dust, dawn, rain, snow, you need to make sure you're easier to see. If you're having trouble seeing others, others will have trouble seeing you. Turn on your headlights, uh, not just your identification lights or clearance lights, and use low beams, high beams can bother other people at daytime as well. Regulation on that. Okay, anybody know the regulation on having your headlights on in New York State? Right. Any, any time where wipers are on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. When else? Uh, Stop. Sunset. Sunset. Okay, so sunset. we're allowed prior to sunrise, right? There you go. So after a half hour after sunset, right? All the way up through to a half hour before sunrise, basically that darkness time. Okay. And then what? Less than a thousand feet. If you have less than a thousand feet of visibility, turn your headlights on. And then we talked about rain, snow, sleet, anything that you have to turn your wipers on for. Any questions there? All right. And when in doubt, what should we do? Turn them on. Turn them on. Trust me, it's not going to cost any more energy to run with your headlights on. And for some companies, that may be policy. Maybe policy. You turn all your lights on, you're having the lights on all the time. That's just what we do. And that's okay. But permit, just understand that. Now, when parked on the side of the road, when you pull off the road and stop, be sure to turn on your four-way <coughs> flashers. It's important, especially at night, don't trust your taillights to give warning to others. Drivers have crashed into the rear of parked vehicles because they thought it was normally moving. Highlight this, circle this, that will be a question. So if you have to pull over on the side of the road, make sure your four-ways are on, not just your parking lights, because you will get rear-ended. That's what we're trying to avoid. Okay? There will be a question on this because this is very dangerous. Okay, so if you must stop on the road or shoulder of any road, you must put out your warning devices within how many minutes? Ten. Great, how many fingers do you have? Five. Ten, Ten. Ten fingers, right? Yeah. That's how you remember that. It's gonna take two hands to get your triangles out. Use both hands, get them out there in 10 minutes. Put the numbers together, it works, okay? So 10 minutes you have to get those triangles out. Okay, great. Where do we put them? Depends on the road width. Yeah. There are three triangles. Okay. Triangle number one goes in the same spot no matter what. Ten feet to the rear of the vehicle. Done. Always in the same spot. <clears throat> Triangle number two always goes in the same spot. One hundred feet behind the rear of the vehicle. Everybody with me on this so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got ten feet, one hundred feet. The only option is the third triangle now. Where do we put that one? That's the variable on the traffic now. If you have two lane highway, which is an undivided highway, okay, kind of like the roads out here, like Arrow Drive, right? That's undivided, which means we're dealing with traffic coming at us. We would take that other triangle and put it 100 feet to the front, okay? What if we're on a divided highway? So now we're up on the 90. We don't have anybody coming at us. So where would we put the third triangle? 200 feet behind you. Now, after you place all the triangles, okay, the last triangle behind your vehicle goes up to 500 feet of warning. So if you have a blind hill, blind curve, blind whatever, that last one, wherever you placed it, goes up to 500. So if you, it could be between 100 up to 500 or 200 <laughs> up to 500, depending on how they're placed. Do you understand that on triangles? Any questions on triangles? Great. How many minutes do you have to get them out? <laughs> Great. Yes, ma'am. Anytime you're going to be sitting on the side of the road more than 10 minutes. 
So whether you're broke down, whether you're there delivering freight, whatever you're doing, if you're going to be sitting on the side of that road more than 10 minutes and we're an issue, you need to get those triangles out. And if you're just waiting, because there's a bus stop right there as well, it sits there for a while, but I never see them putting out. Okay, so in that particular area, they wouldn't have to do that. Buses go into a different area with that, but all commercial vehicles in general will do this. When we're getting out in the country, so let's say we have a bus that's waiting somewhere out in the country, they're generally not going to sit in the middle of the lane at a 55 mile an hour speed zone. Okay? It's always going to be a bus pull off area. And even, and maybe I'm wrong on that, maybe uh, Amy can give you more information. Most of the buses are getting pulled off enough that cars can get around. Okay? If you're out of the way and things aren't an issue, this isn't necessarily prevailing. We're talking parked, okay? If you're sitting in the driver's seat, are you technically parked? Not really, you're stopped. Okay? There's a difference between parking and stopping. Okay? Breakdown, breakdown, we're broke down. You want to make sure you get those triangles out because now we're not really just stopping. We're pretty much parked until we get fixed. You see how we kind of define the definition between those? All right, so any questions on the triangles here? On the bottom, guess what, it's a box. What do we do with the box? Yep, highlight it because what does this one say? Carry the triangles between you and traffic. So that way they can see the reflective triangle. They're gonna see that triangle before they see you. That's safety, carry them between you and traffic. All right, kind of important, that will be on the test. <laughs> They're pretty good folks, not bad. There's your, your 10, 100, 200. There's your 100, 10, 100. And then this will go into your up to 500. Okay, using your horn. This would be something you want to know. There'll probably be a question on the test about this. Your horn can let others know you're there. It can help to avoid an accident or crash and your, use your horn when needed. However, this is critical. However, it can startle others and could be dangerous when used unnecessarily. So again, we're always gonna balance when we're using this horn and not using this one. You really have to be the professional of the road, make sure you're communicating. If you're using this via the emotion or temper, you're in the wrong, wrong spot here. Controlling speed. All right, any questions yet to where we're at before I get into speed? We're good? Okay. Everybody still surviving with me? We're good? All right. Have I made this too boring? Are we, are we doing okay with that? No, it's good. good. All right, you wouldn't tell me if you did, right? All right, controlling speed. Driving too fast is a major cause of fatal crashes. You must adjust your speed depending on driving conditions. This includes traction, curves, visibility, traffic, and hills. And again, we're already doing this in your cars, right? Yeah. Just understand we have a little bit larger vehicle here, a little bit more weight. So that has to be managed even more, okay? So stopping distance, this is something you will need to know. Understand the equation. Stopping distance is perception, reaction, braking, and that equals total stopping. So let me talk you through this. Put it into something you understand. Has anybody here not had a deer run out in front of them yet? Okay, have you ever had an animal run out in front of you? A squirrel, anything? We've all had that? Okay, we've all had something, come on, right, okay. This is what we're talking about. Put whatever that thought is in your head. Perception. Perception is the amount of time it's taking for your brain to say, oh, we got a problem. Perception, perceived it as a problem, okay? Reaction. Reaction is you taking your foot and actively moving into the brake to begin braking the vehicle. This is your physical body reacting to the situation. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Third. The braking distance, that is the mechanical braking or stopping of the piece of machine. That's the car, right? So we had to perceive what ran out in front of us, then we have to react to it physically, and then we have to get the vehicle to stop under its own measure. Those three things together equal total stopping distance. That will be on the test, okay? This is a very important situation. Everybody understand that? Okay. Now, let's talk about distances here. Everything we're talking about is at 55 mile an hour. Everything we talk about here is under hydraulic brakes. Okay. And the distance your vehicle travels in ideal conditions from the time your eye sees a hazard until your brain recognizes it. Keep in mind certain mental and physical conditions can affect your perception distance. It can be affected greatly depending on visibility and hazard itself. 
the average perception time for the alert driver, one and three quarter seconds at 55 mile an hour, that is 142 feet travel. You travel 142 feet before your brain says, oh, hey, think about that. Now, if you're a little bit slower to that, you need to account for that at some point. Permit part of it, 142 feet. Reaction, that's our foot going from the throttle to the brake. At 55, that's about three quarters of a second, and that's about 61 feet. So think about this, 142 plus 61, we've traveled 200 feet before we even started to get the vehicle to stop. Everybody understand what we're doing with this? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of distance, folks. A lot of distance. Lot of distance yeah. Braking distance. Braking distance, the distance your vehicle will travel in ideal conditions while you're braking at 55 on dry pavement, good brakes. This is the ideal situation. Perfect vehicle, perfect everything. 216 feet. Now, if you put all that together, total stopping distance in this vehicle is 419 feet at 55. You'll need to know that. That's a lot of footage, right? Think about that for a second. Okay, let's say life goes wrong. Okay, as a matter of fact, I'm going to put myself in the situation because I can pick on myself. Okay, you don't have to crack on me, but that's a good thing, right? Leave it open. I'll do a fine job on my own. So let's say something happened. I'm, I'm in the middle of the road, and this truck is coming at me. If he stops this close to me, am I okay? No. If he stops this close to me, he didn't touch me. I would be the happiest person in the world. I may have choice words to say. I may have a heart attack in the middle of this. As long as he don't touch me, I'm, a, I'm alive, mm -hmm. right? That's an inch, give or take. We're talking footage. We're talking 419 feet. Okay, so you stop that much past me. How's my day going? Uh, man. <laughs> That's a bad day. That's a really bad day, and I probably won't care. So I probably won't be here to talk about it. So understand this is footage, but put it in perspective for yourself and understand that this is a real thing. That's why I said within 500 feet, we call it a kill zone because it takes that amount of time to stop. Now all of these that are out there driving your car, you drive around today and see these commercial vehicles, you get in front of them, think about their stopping distance for a change. You go, huh, if I hit my brakes right now, they can't stop as fast as I can. Okay? Now, any questions on the stopping distance stuff? Okay, moving on, there's your stopping distance charts. Again, we're using the last one, 419 feet. That's the one that they're gonna really pound down when it comes to the permit part of the test. There's the, the last one, 55 mile an hour. That's the one they're gonna look at for the test. The effects of speed on stopping distance. Okay, you need to know this paragraph. They will ask you questions about this whole paragraph. So understand this paragraph, put it to mind. The faster you drive, the greater the impact of striking power of your vehicle. Whenever you double your speed from 20 to 40, the impact is four times greater. So two is gonna get you four. If you double your speed, it's four times the impact, four times the stopping distance. The braking distance is also four times longer. Now, if you triple your speed, so we go from 20 to 60, the impact and braking distance is nine times greater, okay? So two is going to get you four, three is going to get you nine. Okay. Now, increase the speed to 80 from 20, okay, so four times. Increase the speed to 80 and the impact and braking distance are 16 times greater than 20. Does everybody understand? So if we reduce speed, think about that for a second, if we reduce speed, what do we do to our stopping distance and impact? Reduced it by a considerable amount. Okay, this is what we're after. You will need to know these numbers though. Okay, so if you double your speed four times, it's always multiply, multiply. So if you double it and times it by two, it's two times two. If you triple it, it's three times three. If you quadruple it, it's four times four. That's how you remember the numbers. We're good with that? Yeah. Okay. The effect of weight on stopping distance, the heavier the vehicle, the more the brakes must uh, do to stop it, and the more heat they must absorb it. But the brakes, tires, springs, and shock absorbers on heavy vehicles are designed to work best when the vehicle is fully loaded. Empty trucks require greater stopping distances because an empty vehicle has less traction. Let me talk about that for a second. Does everybody understand what a bobtail is? A bobtail is just the tractor part of a tractor trailer. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So they may ask these questions on the permit test. If we take that bobtail and have that try and stop at 55, and we have another vehicle, empty tractor trailer, and have them try and stop at 55, and then we have a third vehicle, tractor trailer, fully loaded, 80,000 pounds, try and stop, okay? Which one will stop first? Which one will stop second? Which one will stop third? Show it real quick. Show of hands, how many say the bobtail stops first? Show of hands, how many say the empty truck and trailer stop first? Show of hands, how many say the fully loaded tractor trailer stops first? You would be correct in that statement, folks. Here's why. Even though we have 80,000 pounds versus 26,000 pounds versus 20,000 pounds, the loaded one will stop quicker. Why? Because we're forcing and holding the, the tires to the ground. If we have the bobtail, just the tractor, we have eight tires aired up at 100 pounds pressure with no weight on them. You step on the brake, there's nothing holding those tires to the ground, and they just skid, okay? So that's why it's important to understand that you gotta hold the tires, you gotta have the traction. That's why fully loaded may stop sooner than an empty truck. Okay, they may ask that somehow, some way within the test. Just understand that thought process and why that works, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. Matching speed to the road surface. You can't steer or brake a vehicle unless you have traction. Traction is the friction between the tires and the road. There are some road conditions that reduce traction and call for lower speeds. Same as driving your car, okay? Put this in a way you can perceive. So it'll take longer to stop, be harder to turn. Uh, wet roads can double your stopping distance. Okay, so you may need to know that. When the road is slippery, wet roads can double your stopping distance. You must drive slower to be able to stop in the same distance as on dry roads, reduce speed by one third. So starting right here, all the way through, you'll need to know, reduce your speed by one third on wet pavement. On packed snow, you reduce it by half or more. And if, the slip, if it becomes icy, we reduce to a crawl and get off the road as soon as possible. There's your three circumstances, okay? And they will ask this on the test. It's all about that. And we kind of do that now. If we're in a 55, and we're driving down the 90 and it's starting to puddle with water on the road, do we maintain 55? Not if you like your car, you don't. We reduce, right? Okay. Now, if we get on packed snow, do we slow down? If you like your car, you do, right? We normally reduce by about half. So, and then if we get on black ice or on ice, one, we hopefully shouldn't bend there, but if we incur it and take on it, what should we do? Get to a crawl and get off that road because the ice is deadly, folks. You have nothing to work with. Now, identifying slippery surfaces. Um, sometimes it's hard to know though, but here are some areas, shaded areas, bridges, melting ice, black ice, vehicle icing, just after it begins raining and hydroplane. Those are the ones that we're really gonna go after the most. Is there anything on that list that someone don't understand? Great, does everybody understand what hydroplaning is? We're gonna work the list backwards, right? That's where the vehicle rides up on the surface of the water. Can that happen at low speeds? Yes. Can that happen even with a fully loaded tractor trailer? Yes. Okay. Just after it begins to rain, why is the first rain within the first 20 minutes or so so dangerous? If the oil's on the road are mixing with the water, and we have like an oil slick. Okay. Talk about icing. Let's talk a little bit about ice. Ice cubes. Maybe have a really good freezer at their house. Really good. You grab the ice cube by the ice cube tray. Is it slippery? No, it actually sticks to your hand. If you got a good ice box, it'll stick to your hand. It's not slippery at all. So therefore, if you hang on to that ice now and it starts to melt and you get water on top of the ice, or you try and pick that ice cube out of the water glass, is that really slippery? Yeah. Absolutely. This is how we have to perceive this. This is what's happening on the roads. Same thing. So shaded areas, that's still icy, right? Bridges. Bridges have a tendency to freeze before the road surface and probably the last to thaw, right? Mm -hmm. So we would have ice. Melting ice. So let's picture nighttime. The roads have iced up a little bit. We're driving on the ice. We know what we're on right now. All of a sudden, the sun comes out. And we've seen this. Sun comes out and hits that road surface, right? What does it start doing to the road surface in that ice? Melting. It starts to melt it, right? So now we're at that transition point. That's when the roads become very slippery, folks. Okay, that starts to transition over. This is where we can lose control over a vehicle. 
All of a sudden, that will get past the ice, though, and turn to what? Water. Turn to just water, right? Mm -hmm. Now, put that together with these areas that may not have thawed. Shaded areas. Now we have the water, as it's starting to melt, getting dragged up on top of the ice in the shaded area because that didn't get the sun. Now you see how we have that wet ice cube effect again. Same with the bridges. We're drawing the water up on top of that bridge. We have that wet ice cube effect once again. Melting ice, we just talked about that. Black ice, what's black ice? It's ice you can't see. Yeah, exactly, it's that thin layer of ice you can't see, right? You see right through it. Okay, so here's the hard, hard question. What are two ways to melt when you're on black ice? And then that's not after you lost control, before you lose control. Reflection of light. The ground shiny. They're all shiny. And the shinier the road, the less traction you have. Water can be shiny too. Try again. Your room was moving? Two things. One, sound. Listen to your vehicle. Friction is caused by the sound of your tires against the road. That sound that you hear is friction. Mm -hmm. If we put ice between your tires and that, that road surface, there's no friction. Mm. Therefore, no what? Sound. No sound. Your vehicle goes awfully quiet, you got problems. Okay, and I don't care if that sounds snow, we've heard it on snow, everybody can picture that, right? Mm -hmm. You got snow on the ground, your car gets very quiet, don't it? Why? Because you have no friction. You have no traction. Same with ice, all of a sudden your vehicle will be quiet. That's a good time to have your radio turned on paying attention. Second one, look at your tires. If you look in the mirror and you look at your tires and you have a bunch of mist coming off of them, are we on ice or water? water? Water. If that mist disappears, what are we on? Exactly. Look at the cars coming at you. Watch the mist on their tires. Okay? That way you can see it coming into it. You see how this works? So those are two things that we can pick up right away. The sad part is most people don't know that. You sitting in the class, if you didn't know that, remember this when you're out on the road as a professional driver, most car drivers don't know that either, okay? That's why we choose kind of when we're out there and when we're not out there, because if we go out there and it's a sheet of ice, we're just waiting for someone to slide into us. That's really what it's about, we're careful with that. We wanna make sure we're not putting ourselves in that position the best we can, okay? And we have to be aware of it. We watch for cars sliding through intersections, playing on them losing control. Vehicle icing. Okay, when can we tell if the vehicle's icing? Right. Look at the back of the mirrors. Look at the back of the mirrors. They'll have a thin sheet of ice on them. Look at the, the water dripping off the bottom of the mirrors. They'll have ice. Look at your road signs, and that'll tell you when you come into ice too. Have you ever done this one? Look at your tree branches, your, your weeds, your grass. If it starts to look like it has ice gathering on it, we're on ice. Look at your guardrails, it's all ice. Vehicle icing is the same way. We just gather ice on our vehicle in every, every spot. Can this be dangerous at all? <clears throat> Absolutely. It's a lot of extra weight to the vehicle, but if it also plugs up the air intake or the radiator, it could also cause the vehicle to overheat. Okay, so we always want to be aware of that. All right, any questions on this area? Okay. Talked about hydroplaning, raindrops, speed and curves. Actually, we did really good tonight, folks. I mean, I'm looking at the time, looking at all this, and I think we're right on the top. Let me just see if I want to hit this one. We'll come back and we'll pick up with speed when you come back. So you note in your book, we are on uh, page 1221. We just finished up on, so we'll continue back on page 1222. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we do have a lot of ground to cover tonight. We're we'll starting on 2-22 for the page in the book. Last night we gave you a, a website to go to to do some practice tests. Uh, you can see me on break, we'll give you that, that address. How many of you did not take any of those tests last night or today? Wait, you, you see the other? Yeah, those practice ones? Yeah. Did he take it? Didn't take it. Okay, so there's a few of you that didn't take it. Okay, try and get it done. It will help, it really truly will. Because it takes a few swipes at it sometimes to understand how they're asking their questions. You know, it's like when I started teaching yesterday, remember? I was kind of word by word, I was soft tailing into it, because you had to learn how I communicate, how I talk, how I speak, how everything happens. Once I got that under control, 
everybody was used to it, and I could really accelerate into it. Same with these questions. Get online, do those practice tests, and, and that will help. The first swipe at it, you're probably gonna fail. That's okay. Second swipe, you're gonna go, I got this now. And most of the time, that works very well. Plus, if you did take it, those of you that took it, I'm sure you got extra questions now. You're probably like, wait a minute. <laughs> What's this? What's that? We didn't cover this. We didn't cover that. I don't remember this. And, and yeah, yeah, I wonder what that is. That's what I'm after. As I go through everything tonight, a lot of that should start to make sense. You go, yes, there was a test question. They do have a lot of different series of tests down there. So some of the questions you had on that particular site may be exact what you're going to see down there. And I've had tests down there that were nothing like those tests. At least it's information, get the information in, understand how they will twist and turn the words. Make sure you're reading your questions slow. One word can change the whole thing. They put that little word not in there. You know, which one is not the right answer? They'll throw you off every time. Get a good night's rest before you do it. Don't overdo the caffeine, that type of thing. Just read slow, be methodical, do it right once. Okay, any major questions before I get started? Okay. All right, then I'm going to kind of get into it here. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, speed and curves. Drivers must adjust their speed for curves in the road. If you take a curve too fast, two things can happen. Either the tires can lose their traction and continue straight ahead, or you skid off the road. Okay? Or the tires keep their traction and the vehicle rolls over. Tests have shown that trucks with a high center of gravity can roll over at the posted speed limit for curves. So we understand that. So we've seen this. You see the curve in the road, it's posted at 35. How many of you are doing that with your car plus, right? With these commercial vehicles, if that's posted at 35, depending on the vehicle, we could still roll it at 25. So we really want to pay attention. And we have to judge that coming into each and every single curve. Now, that's why the next paragraph here is kind of important. You want to highlight this one. Uh, slow to a safe speed before you enter a curve. Breaking in a curve is dangerous because it's easier to lock the wheels and cause a skid. Slow down as needed and don't exceed the posted limit. Be in a gear that allows you to slightly accelerate through the curve. Any questions on that? Get it slowed down before. Remember we talked about downshifting? Slow it down before. Give yourself room to slightly accelerate. If you have any in here rides motorcycle, it's the same thing. Slow down before the curve, slightly accelerate through. Okay, speed and distance ahead. You should always be able to stop within the distance you can see ahead. That's critical. If you get nothing else out of this book, remember that first sentence. Okay? You should always be able to stop within the distance you can see ahead because that varies within the distance. It varies with weight. There's so many variables, but if you can't see it, how can you drive it? You got these little knolls in the road, blind curves. Can't see, slow down. Always be within your stopping distance within some. Okay. The uh, fog, rain, or other conditions may require that you slow down and be able to stop within the distance you can see. At night, you can't see as far with your low beams on. So, uh, you, this is with your high beams. So, when you use low beams, make sure you slow down. Everybody understands that part. I mean, that's kind of a common sense thing. And again, don't forget what you already know. You drive a car already. Don't lose parameters of some of this stuff. Speed and traffic flow. Before I even get into this, what do you think is the safest speed? Below the traffic flow, at traffic flow, or above traffic flow? Yeah. At traffic flow. That's the key. Okay. What's that? Because anytime you vary speed from everybody else, you start creating a hazard. Once you get more than 15, mile an hour, no, 15 miles per hour under the speed of the others, your chances of having an accident are crazy. Absolutely crazy. And remember, you have to, you have to detach some of what you think versus what's in the book because this is what they're going to ask you on that test. After you get the permit in your hand, I don't care if you do 10 under, you do what you do. But... You know, this is what we're going to do for the permit test. Speed of traffic. That's where we are at. So if everybody else is doing 35, our safest speed is 35. Okay, now that we said that, let's get into this. Uh, when you're driving a traffic, 
I don't need to repeat it, do I? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Speeding. Does speeding save you time, really? Mm -hmm. No. 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 What gets you to your destination faster? Mm -hmm. Efficiency. Mm -hmm. That's what gets you there faster, mm -hmm. folks. Okay. So uh, your chances of an accident are much higher. And it's harder. When you have these vehicles, they're weighing a lot of weight. Speeding them up and slowing them down is a huge issue. It's not like your car where you can zip zip all the time. Speed and downgrades, let's talk about that. Your vehicle speed will increase on downgrades because of gravity. <coughs> the most important objective is to select and maintain a speed that's not too fast for the total weight and cargo of the vehicle, length of the grade, steepness of the grade, road conditions, and weather. We're good with that, everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. When it comes to it comes to these grades, comes to curves, turns, all this performance, I want you to picture yourself, okay? Picture the most slippery as possible shoe you could possibly have on your feet. That's how we navigate out there. So if your shoes are slippery and you're coming up to a, a hill, what do you do? As a human being, what would you do? You'd slow down a little bit, right? Be like, ooh, that kind of steep hill. Because if we run at the exact same speed, we will lose control going down. Make sense? Mm -hmm. If you're running full bore and you have slippery shoes on and you go to turn, how's that gonna work out for you? Not now you understand why we slow down before the curves. Put it into a parameter that you can understand. Everybody get that point? Mm -hmm. Now we add the weight, the length of the grade, stuff like that. Okay. So a 100 pound person versus a 200 pound person, I may have to go a little slower, okay? I'm a little top heavy. So there's all these parameters kick in anytime. Same with the vehicles, the exact same thing, okay? So if your cargo, like your passengers, they sit a little higher up, that makes that bus sway a little bit. Anybody ever ride a bus? Mm -hmm. Don't say you get that sway to them, okay? Think about that on a curve. Okay, try to stop that bus coming down a grade. All this has to factor in. The speed limit is posted where there's a sign indicating maximum safe speed, never exceed the speed shown. Okay, also look for, uh, look for and need warning signs indicating the length and steepness of the grade. Does everybody understand percentage of grades? Okay, 5% grade versus 10% grade. Okay, so. If you're to have 100 feet length, okay, 10% grade means for that 100 feet, you would drop 10%, so that would be 10 feet, okay? So for every 100 feet covered, it's 10 feet lower. Now, if you have a tractor trailer that's 100 feet in length, that's 10 feet lower than the nose is versus the tail. Make sense? All right, so what's a 5% grade then? At 100 feet, how much did we drop? Five. Five feet. So you see which one's steeper now. And 10% is a pretty good grade, so you know. All right. Is that 10? 10 is a pretty good grade. So basically, the higher the number on the percent grades, the steeper the grade. Okay. What do you mean by grade? Grade, hill. Um, you don't get a lot of that around here, but like hills. Like you go out into like Letchworth Park area, you go towards the south area. You get into some more hills where the road's up and down a lot. They can actually measure the percent grade of where that's going down. Yeah, well, we got West Virginia, Mons, all, yeah, all the other states are totally a different issue. Any other questions? Okay. Another way to think about that um, with the grades, think about a, a handicapped wheelchair ramp. We've seen those, some are steeper than others. That's, that's a grade. That's the steepness of a grade. Same thing with the hill. Everyone familiar with the Skyway bridge? Yeah. That's got a pretty good grade to it. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, especially when it's icy, right? Okay. Any other questions on the grade thing here? Now, the braking effect of the engine is the greatest when it's near the governed RPMs. So, this third line down. You must use the braking effect of the engine as the principal way of controlling your speed on downgrades. Let me talk about that. Okay. 
That means you want the engine of that vehicle and that vehicle holding the vehicle back going down the hill, not relying on the brakes. The brakes are secondary to that. Make sense? We're good? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so, the what's that? That's the, yeah. That's the engine brake. We were talking about retarders. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, we turned those retarders on too. But the engine compression itself, as long as we gear down, that engine compression will hold that truck pretty good. And that's why we gear those trucks down. That's why we use the transmission and the engine together. Okay, so there will be a question on the test about that. What is the primary way of coming down the hills? And it's with the, the use of the vehicle or the engine itself. Brakes are secondary. Now, while we're talking about this, I'm just going to interject it now. It's going to come back up later, but they're going to talk about safe driving, braking, coming down the hill. Okay. When you're coming down the hills, what they want is a low gear before you crash the hill. We get down to a low gear, we start coming down that, that hill, or that grade, and you're going to let that engine come up to a high RPM. Okay, that's where that engine is doing its most work with the compression of the engine holding the vehicle back. <clears throat> when it gets to that high RPM, we're going to step on the brake firmly, but not hard, firmly, and slow the truck down five miles per hour after that. So we're slowed down five miles per hour, then you take your foot off the brake. And eventually that engine's gonna start increasing speed, increasing in RPM, gets back to the high RPM, step on the brake, slow it back down five miles per hour. Get off the brake, it'll speed itself back up, high RPM, back on the brake, slow it down five miles per hour. That's the process. Learn that in your head now. That will be on every single endorsement test. Okay? So we understand that. Controlled braking. Controlled braking is when you have light steady pressure on the vehicle, but this is downgrade braking, which is different than that. Because controlled braking and stab braking, you put them together for emergencies. Okay, so let's talk about roadway work zones. Um, speeding traffic is, is the number one cause of injury and death in the roadway work zone. Everybody knows you gotta slow down for zones. I don't need to talk about this anymore. Great, moving on. Managing space. Uh, to get safe driving, you need to manage space all around your vehicle. Again, ahead, to the rear, to the sides, above, below, all areas, manage that space. Of all the space around your vehicle, the area ahead of the vehicle is the space you're driving into. That is the most important, okay? The need for space ahead. Do you remember the time we talked about yesterday? How far ahead we're supposed to be looking? 12 to 15 seconds, right? That's the same as a city block at low speeds, same as a quarter mile at high speeds, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's how far time-wise we're looking, okay? And distance. This... This is going to be our following distance for the vehicle in front of us. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That space ahead of us. Regardless of the vehicle, here's your formula that's right in the box. Remember, anything in a box, highlight it because it will be on the test. You take one second for every 10 foot of vehicle. So if you have a 40 foot bus, how many seconds? Four. Four. Okay, now that's at low speeds. If we're above 40 mile an hour, then we add one second. So it'd be a five second following distance. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So if my vehicle is 100 feet in length, how many seconds? 10 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. And if I'm over 40 mile an hour? 11, 11, 11 seconds. Everybody with me on that? We're good? Okay, moving on. So basically we just covered that in this how much space area here. If you want to highlight that instead, it doesn't matter. Just know that your footage is for every 10 feet equals one second. That's what you need to know. Does everybody know how to count seconds off? Anybody not know how to count seconds off? Okay, good. Okay, so when you're driving down the road, you can do this on your way home tonight. Look at the vehicle in front of you and when their back bumper passes a stationary object, a shadow on the ground, a road sign, a mark on the road, whatever. You start counting, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Whatever it is, when your front bumper gets to the same place, that's how many seconds are between you and the vehicle in front of you. Okay? 
Okay, that's a good time enough. Okay. okay, so that's what they're describing here in this particular area. <coughs> Moving on to the next page. Space behind, you can't stop others from following you too closely. Okay, that's just the way this is. Yeah, in the commercial industry, you will always be tailgating. If you have a problem with tailgating, you might want to check that right now because you'll be tailgated all the time. Okay? Now, so we stay to the right. We try the best we can to kind of help them get around. We stay to the right. If there's two lanes, we try to stay to the right lane of the two. Okay? Anytime we can kind of get to the right and get out of the way, that's what we're doing in that commercial vehicle. Especially going up hills and stuff like that. Dealing with tailgaters. Okay. I'm not going to get into the illusion of why people tailgate. Most people take it as an aggressive act. It's normally not. Um, it, it's just poor quality driving is all it is. When you're dealing with tailgaters, learn how to deal with them safely. One, if you're driving, when you're driving slowly, drivers get trapped behind their vehicles. Okay. So in bad weather, sometimes they'll tailgate us because they can't see where they're going. So there's reasons why they kind of get stuck there. If you find yourself being tailgated, these four bullets right here, you will need to know for the permit test. I will guarantee it's gonna be on that test. So then we're talking about avoid quick lane changes, okay? If you have to slow down or turn, signal early and reduce speed very gradually. Increase your following distance. This is normal people get mixed up. If you are being tailgated, you increase your following distance with the vehicle in front of you because that way you don't have to make any sudden moves. It's nice and gentle, okay? That opens up room in front of your vehicle as well. So if they can get a chance to pass and get around you, you just open it up for them, let them go, okay? Don't speed up. Uh, it's safer to be tailgated at a low speed than a high speed. And more often than not, when you're being tailgated, it's nothing to do with speed. I mean, they're just following closer. That's all they're doing. So if you do 10 over, they're going to do 10 over right with you most of the time. They're not paying attention to it. And avoid playing tricks. Uh, don't turn your tail lights on or flash your brake lights. Follow the suggestions above. Everybody with me on that? Everybody good with this tailgating thing? Do I need to really beat this in more? Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Space to the sides. Okay. Commercial vehicles are often wide and take up most of the lane. Safe drivers know how to use what little space we have, okay? So what we want to do is we want to avoid traveling next to other commercial vehicles. Stagger yourself, okay? And if you can then stagger away from the cars, do that too. Because if something happens, remember, it's gonna take us over 400 feet to stop, right? Almost 500 feet. It, we can't stop most of the time. So if we left space to our sides, it, it gives us a place that we can kind of turn and get into, leading yourself and out is what we call it. Now, staying centered in the lane, that's kind of a critical thing. You don't want to be leaning to the left side or leaning to the right side, stay centered. Um, traveling next to others, again, make sure you don't do that. This will be on the test. Okay, so you know, these three high, the three bold print areas here, stay centered in the lane. Uh, don't travel next to others. And then we get into strong winds. So any questions on that part yet with, with that? It's kind of a common sense thing. Most of us do it anyway in our cars. Strong winds. Yesterday we talked about strong winds, remember? Mm -hmm. Remember we step on the throttle, don't hit the brake, don't let off the gas, step on the throttle, it's momentum. Fantastic, where are we normally gonna catch with strong winds? Where is that normally going to hit us? Open fields, open highways, going over bridges, and the most common is coming out of tunnels, right? That's where it's going to be the worst, because even in the open field, you kind of get used to it coming in, because you're getting some coming in, but with the tunnels, there's no wind in that tunnel. You come out of those tunnels, woof, and blow you right over, right? So pay attention to that. Is it more of a problem for light vehicles or heavy vehicles? Light, light, light vehicles, light. Light. definitely light vehicles. Space overhead. Hitting overhead objects is a danger. It's always one of our issues. Make sure you have enough overhead clearance. So two things here. One, don't assume the posted heights and bridges and overpasses are correct. Repaving or patched snow may have reduced the clearances. 
since they were posted, the weight of the cargo can change its height. Think about that. So if we load it heavy, just like your car, you put a lot of people in there, it's gonna sit a little bit lower. It's the same with this. So be aware of your clearances. You know, if it looks low, pay attention to it. Slow it down, get it to a stop. You know, the common times you're gonna see that, especially going into the, the business you're looking to go into here, low wires, low power, or low power lines, um, branches, stuff like that. Stuff that you've been clearing all summer long, all fall, all that stuff. Next thing you know, you get a good heavy snow, and everything's sagging. You've seen it in our cars, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Moving on. If you doubt you have enough safe space to, to pass under an object, go slowly. Remember, it's better to, to stop and take a look than to just whack it at 55 mile an hour. Okay? You have a bridge that you're not sure about, walk and stop, take a look. Okay? Crawl up to it, look out your window, check it out. Some of the roads can cause a vehicle to tilt. That's one that a lot of people really forget and don't consider when you're in a large vehicle or a tall vehicle. Um, so everybody understands the tilt that we're talking about. So your roads have a crown to them. They have a curve to them. Mm -hmm. Some of those are very accented. Okay? So if we're driving a bus and we're in the right lane next to that curve or we're driving a tractor trailer or a truck, the top part of our vehicle is actually over closer to the curb line and tree line than our tires are because of the tilt, because of the pitch of the road. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have to consider that when we're driving down the road. Worst tilt I had, I was about, about a half a lane over with the tires, and my tops were almost hitting the trees. That was a lot of tilt. That was out in Rhode Island. A lot of tilt on the road. Before you back into an area, you want to take a look. Check for overhanging wires, objects, trees, branches. Let's get out and look. You know, when you pull up, you know, just snap it in somewhere, it's, it's safer to get up and down because you can't take it all in when you're pulling up. You walk in, you go, oh, I didn't see that. Before you back into a building, back into a shop, back in anywhere, uh, you know, that's one of the hazards that you'll see. You go, wow, I backed in there a hundred times this week. Okay, well, maybe a shop, maybe a hundred times this week, but maybe someone left a wrench there. Maybe someone has something laying there. Maybe someone was backing up in a different direction that you didn't see. So make sure you get out and take a look. Space below, many drivers forget about the space underneath their vehicles. When you get these crowns in the road, you gotta make sure that you're gonna clear that stuff. We've all seen the signs or heard of tractor trailers getting hung up on tracks, right? It's because the tracks have a little rise to them. So let's say the tracks have a rise of about a foot. You have a very low run or low hung <clears throat> semi that's only got four inches of clearance on its belly. As soon as it gets up on top of that, with four inches of clearance and it's a foot rise, we're hung up all day long. So make sure that you're aware of your clearance underneath. You know this in your cars, right? You know, you've seen the speed bumps, right? And maybe he's lowered your car or seen someone lower the car, you're like, ooh, mm -hmm. they ain't getting in there. That's exactly the way it works, okay? I have a question. Yes, sir. Until you get to that. You don't know how high it is up until you actually get to the railroad. You can't count. You can't count the trees now. No, you don't know how, okay. you, how high your truck is. So here's here's what I will say to that. One, with the bus routes that you're going to be on in this business, they're going to give you your routes. They know what the roads are. It's not going to be an issue in this circumstance. Two, if you're running road, running roads that you have no idea, no one else knows has, has any idea. Check the route before you get there. You need to get on these maps. You need to understand where the railroad tracks are. Watch your signs coming up because there's always a clearance sign. If it's a, a big rise in the tracks, it's always those. Uh, when in doubt, stop, back it up. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question on that. Yep. Just in general, well, any, any kind of vehicle you drive, you got to see it. Or when in doubt, back up. back up. I've had places where I got in there, I'm like, mm, this ain't going to work. Two miles backwards. There's only certain triggers that are signal that you can't go under and bump the railroad. That is correct. That is correct. You know, and sometimes, you know, in the commercial industry, we don't know where the property is. Sometimes we're like, well, we know they're near the bridge, but that's why we call ahead and get directions. Because they can give us the idea of, hey, where are we? And, oh, you can't come in this way. You have to go all the way around because of the bridge. You have okay. to read those signs. You do. Now, bridges in New York State are marked one foot lower than their actual height. 
So if the bridge is marked for 11 feet, what's its actual height? 12 feet. 11 feet, 12 feet. 10 feet, 11 feet. Everybody with me on that? Well, what if I have a bridge that's marked 11 foot, but it's an arch bridge? The center. The center is even higher, isn't it? What they do is they mark the bridge at its lowest point. So 11 feet would be at the low part of the, where it meets the road. So that means it's probably 12 feet. You go over here on William Street by Queen Street, that's where they used to do all the road tests. It's marked like 1110 or something like that. We used to go underneath the center lane all day long with big trucks. No, no, that, that, that bridge is bad though. I did that when my truck went up the whole back end of it. Yeah, the, uh, that bridge, you know what I'm talking about, Queen Street there? We go under them with 13 six trailers all day long. Yeah, you just gotta be in that center lane. If you're in the right lane, you're not gonna do it. Okay. You can't get under. You can't yep. get under anything. You're not gonna get it done. Then you have the center abutments in the center, so you gotta make sure you put it on the left and don't hit it on the right side. Yeah, it's kind of a touchy bridge. Okay, so any questions on this clearance stuff? I have Bob below behind. I mean, that's kind of common sense thing. Space below, we talked about that. Space for turns. Okay. Turns. Space around a truck or bus is important in turns because of wide turning and off tracking. Does everybody understand what off tracking is? Off tracking means the back tires of the vehicle follow a tighter circle or a tighter parameter than the front wheels of the vehicle. Okay? So if I had a tractor trailer, my front tires are going to be way out there, my trailer tires are going to be cutting it in tight. Same with the bus. You bring the steer tires up to a turn, you start turning right away. Those back tires are going over the curb, aren't they? Yeah. Because they're in a tighter circle, a tighter turning radius. That's what we're talking about here, okay? So, right turns. Here's how we handle right turns. They want you to do a button hook versus a jug handle. Again, anything in these pictures will be on the test. So do you understand the difference between a button hook and a jug handle? A button hook, you go straight into the turn. So let's say I was gonna turn down this center lane here. I would stay in my lane, and if I needed to go further to get my back end of the vehicle to pass, I would pass my lane, go into the oncoming lane over here, and then follow it back around, okay? Versus the jug handle. So the jug handle, what they're talking about with that is you on the approach, you would go in this oncoming traffic here, swing really wide, and then line up on the lane and go down like this. If we did that, what does that open up on our right side? Absolutely. That's why they say we don't do that. Okay. By staying tighter to the right, we block traffic from passing us on the right. We go straight into it, we do that button hook, and that avoids people passing us and the chance of that accident. So you're going to see in here where they say keep the rear of the vehicle closer to the curb to block traffic from passing. Right away. Yes, so it's already to cross the the yellow lines or whatever's in the center lane there. So you're Sometimes actually going yeah. into the oncoming traffic. Yes. The turn. Yes. When when you get into the commercial business, it's curbs and blacktop. Cars are going to move. Yeah. Okay. Now, regulation-wise, we have to do what we have to do to get around here. If you got a telephone pole in the corner, fire hydrant, that's never going to move. So we have to make sure we can get that turn done. When we're making turns and we're judging turns, we're looking at the rear of the vehicle. Did the rear of the vehicle come from the center of this lane, going to the center of this lane and not hit any lines? Doesn't matter where the front of the vehicle went. If you need to take in that oncoming lane for that button hook, wait for it to clear. You can't force your way in. So we all know how to make a left turn at a traffic light. You pull up to the intersection, we just sit there and wait, right? We get a yellow light or we get a clear, one of the two. Same thing on this right turn. You would pull into the turn, don't let your nose cross that center line and just sit there and wait. Wait it out. If the traffic light's there, light will eventually turn green. That traffic's going to go, and eventually someone will let you in, and psh, out you go. Does that make sense? You're just doing a wider turn. Right? Yeah, and sometimes these are wider turns because they're longer wheelbase vehicles. Yep. I just saw that on my way over here, and when he went into that button hook, the traffic had to back up. Yep, absolutely. Get through, so they had to back up. Yeah, and some will. I mean, you'll get some obstinate people that won't. Because they can't. Right, he couldn't go nowhere unless they backed up. Exactly, and you just sit there and wait. Right, that's what he did. It's a waiting game. You just yeah. sit there and wait. Either they go backwards or forwards, but either way, they'll eventually move. What you don't want to do is come out here and pin them in. Right. 
leave them the option to go either direction, just get out of our way and go. Okay. Any questions on this scenario here, the jug handle versus button hook? If you can't remember this, here's how I put it in my brain because I need simple things. Because remember the KISS method that I talked about? Mm -hmm. I correlate and put together jug handle with a whiskey jug. Remember, you can't drink and drive. Mm -hmm. Button hook, I put it with prim and proper and a dress shirt, button shirt. So button is okay, jug handle's not. That's how I put that together in my little way of thinking. But it works. Okay. Um, I think we've covered pretty much everything they're gonna say in these paragraphs here, so I'm gonna jump past it now. Okay, left turns. Left turns, here's what the question will be on the test. You start the left turn from the center of the intersection. There's your answer for the test, folks. Okay, that's, that's every test I've seen out there when it comes to left turns, if they're going to ask it. So what they're saying is you have the center of the intersection, right? When you get to the center of the intersection, that's when you start turning your vehicle. Okay, let's talk about traffic flow. Right. Left turn, left turn goes to left lane. Right turns go to right lane, right? Are you with me on that? Mm -hmm. If we have multiple lanes going left, so let's say there's two lanes going left, in a commercial vehicle, which lane do you wanna be in? Right. The right lane, right? Mm -hmm. We follow that lane all the way around. So. The inside lane would be basically lane one, you're in lane two, you stay in your lane all the way around. Make sense, we're good with that? Yeah. Fantastic, moving on. Space needed to cross and enter traffic, these will be on the test. We're gonna talk about uh, be aware of your size and weight of your vehicle when you cross traffic here, some important things to keep in mind. One, because of slow acceleration and space large vehicles require, you may need a much larger gap to enter traffic than you would with a car. Two, acceleration varies with load. Allow more room if your vehicle is heavily loaded. Three, before you start across the road, make sure you can get all the way across before the traffic gets to you. So don't pull out there going, they got brakes. No, 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 we don't do that in the commercial vehicles here, okay? And I'm sure some of you have done that in your car. Don't worry, they got brakes. No. We have to make sure it's totally clear both ways, okay? Get out there, make our turn, and get moving down the road before traffic catches us. That takes a little time sometimes, okay? If we have to make a right turn and I need the oncoming lane, I still have to wait then for traffic to clear both ways because then I can go out into that lane and come back. Any questions on those? Seeing hazards? Okay. <coughs> what is a hazard? A hazard is any road condition or other road user, driver, bicyclist, pedestrian, that's a possible danger. That's what a hazard is. It's a possible danger. All right, so seeing hazards lets you be prepared. Now, if you, uh, you'll have more time to act if you see hazards before they become emergencies. So, so there'll be a question on the test. Why do we look for hazards? Because hazards turn into emergencies. So we're always looking for these hazards. Oh, this is a hazard. Oh, this is gonna be a problem. Okay, or, oh, there's a hazard. Okay, the problem is resolved, we're good. We go on to the next hazard. That's really what's being said here. So, being prepared is everything. Learning to see hazards, it's often clues that'll help you see that stuff. Any questions on hazards? All right, hazardous roads, move over laws. Does everybody understand the move over law? Mm -hmm. Anybody not? Okay, move over. Okay, so the incidents of law enforcement uh, officers, emergency medical services, fire department personnel, and people working on the road being struck while performing duties on the roadside are increasing at a frightening pace. To lessen the problem, move over laws have been enacted which require drivers to reduce speed and change lanes when approaching a roadside incident or emergency vehicle. Signs are posted on roadways and states that have such laws. So when approaching an authorized emergency vehicle stopped on the roadside or in a work zone, you should proceed with caution, reduce speed, and yield the right of way by making a lane change to the lane not next to that uh, authorized emergency <laughs> vehicle. Okay. So bottom line, you got an officer that someone pulled over on the right side, don't stay in the lane right next to them. Get away from them, reduce speed a little bit. Mm -hmm. okay. Has anyone ever seen that go wrong? Where the officer, that traffic stop goes very wrong? Yeah, it's kind of, a, it, it's interesting. You know, I've watched those go to crap very quickly. Um, 
And even being two lanes away wasn't enough. I mean, it got really bad very quickly. So always expect the worst. The problem is, is so many of us see it go just perfect. The officer pulled off, they got the car, he's up there doing his little ticket thing and everything's fine in the world, okay? You know, when you start seeing the trunk pop open, he's grabbing his assault rifle and, you know, they're standing in the middle of the lane, things get a little different, all right? Now, any other questions on the move over laws? Is that a ticketable offense? Yeah. Well, yeah, you might take someone off. Run that way. You gotta make sure you move over and slow down. Work zones. And uh, any questions on work zones? I can pass for pass that. We understand work zones. Uh, drop offs. Make sure you're aware where the road drops off. Whether they're doing pavement, whether it's a shoulder that drops off, watch out for your drop offs. <coughs> Avoid objects in the road. Okay. Sometimes things fall into the road. Maybe if you're harmless, stuff like that, but we still have to pay attention to them. Now, when it comes to these obstacles in the road, okay, sometimes, most times, you can steer to avoid it long before you can stop for it. So we understand that. So sometimes we see the box up there, we're like, oh, and we, we know we can't stop. But if the lane next to us is clear, what can we do? Steer around it. Don't over exceed it, just, just miss it, bring it back, okay? So we can always steer faster than we'll stop these trucks in most cases. Off ramps and down uh, on ramps, any questions on that? Make sure we're slowing up to, slow to a safe speed before entering the off ramp, that's gonna be the key. Um, we're, they're really dangerous for us. Off ramps and on ramps have posted speed limits, remember stay underneath them. Speeds may be safe for automobiles, but not safe for us. So, and it's also dangerous whenever we're braking and turning at the same time. We want to keep our vehicle in a straight line the best we can. So make sure we're going slow enough before you get on the curved part of the ramp. So that last sentence in this one, that's the one you want to highlight for the test. Make sure you're going slowly enough before you get on the curved part of the off ramp. I have a question. Yes. Let's say you're in the right-hand lane, or two lanes, you know, so two lanes going in one direction and there's an obstacle in front of you in the right-hand lane. Wouldn't you always rather go to the shoulder rather than into the left lane? Because uh, okay, so we're all going the same direction, we're like on the 90? Yeah, because okay. if you go into the left lane, there might be another vehicle over there. Well, this is part of knowing your traffic around you. This is part of being observant. If, that's why I said, if that left lane is clear, we take that first. Because there's no sense taking a shoulder if we have a fully open lane. Mm -hmm. If there's no one in that lane. If there's someone in the lane, well, I'm not pushing them off the road, then I would definitely go to the right. Mm -hmm. So that's where we have to know our traffic at all times in all directions around us. Okay? Well, it's like your car. If you were driving down the road and it was just you on the 90, no one in front of you, no one behind you, what would you do? Okay, drivers who are hazards. You mean other drivers are hazards? Wow, <laughs> didn't see that coming. <laughs> All right, so drivers who are hazards. Uh, people that have blocked vision, okay? So if they're trying to back out of the driveway or pull out of a parking spot, blocked vision, that's always an issue, right? We understand that. Uh, delivery trucks could present a hazard. We're large, we block vision. Parked vehicles can be hazards. Pedestrians and bicyclists can also be hazards. Distractions, if I could go in deeper into any of these, let me know. If none, it's gonna kind of run through them. Mm -hmm. Distractions, kids, kids are big hazards, especially with the ice cream trucks, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's how the ice cream truck normally goes. This is what I've seen, what I've noted. Kids come running across the road for the ice cream truck. Okay, that's great. Is the kid the real problem anymore? What's coming after the kid? Normally it's a household pet, and if there is a pet, great. If there isn't a pet, then who's right behind that? Another kid or a parent, right? Mm -hmm. The kid or the parent, who's actually paying the least attention most of the time? Yeah. The parent. The parent. They worry about the kid. Exactly. They get so focused on the kid, they hear and see nothing. Just like the pet. The pet is protecting its, its family. Mm -hmm. It won't see you. The kid? You might have a 2% chance the kid's gonna look at you. They're gonna make a bad choice after that, mm -hmm. but at least they may have seen you a little bit. So watch that, and you always think about the next step, the next step, the next step. And if you're moving off, 
Absolutely. Always a tip on the grass. Absolutely, there is. Always. Mm -hmm. So we got children here, we got talkers, people talking, other people, and then we got workers, ice cream trucks, disabled vehicles, accidents, shoppers, confused drivers, uh, slow drivers, again, causing a jam up in traffic flow. Drivers signaling a turn may be a hazard because they're signaling right, they turn left. Signaling left, they turn right. Drivers that are in a hurry, you know, they're just not paying attention, they're zip, 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 we all know them. Impaired drivers, do I need to talk about that at all? No. Okay. Uh, so be alert for drunk drivers. Do you ever think you'll see a drunk driver out there driving a commercial vehicle? Oh, you see quite a few. And it's, here's the thing. It's hard to tell the difference between a drunk or impaired driver versus someone falling asleep. Very hard to tell the difference between the two, but both are an issue. Driver body movement as a clue. So if they got the right turn signal on, but they keep leaning left, looking left, they're probably going left. Watch the body movement. Uh, any questions on any of those hazards? Conflicts. Okay, fine, you're in conflict. When you have to change speed and or direction to avoid hitting someone. Conflicts occur at intersections where vehicles meet and it merges such as on ramps, off ramps, stuff like that. So watch for others. This is why we look for hazards, because they turn into emergencies, okay? We do not want to have that conflict. That's what we're trying to avoid. Okay, everybody understand this? Am I going too fast today? Good, because I got a lot of material. If you see something on here that I skim over and you need to talk more about it, stop me. I will talk more about it, okay? If you also come up with questions as I'm coming through, <coughs> ask your questions. Remember that. Always have a plan. You should always be looking for hazards. Continue to learn to see hazards on the road. However, don't forget why you're looking for hazards. Remember me saying this? They may turn into emergencies. You look for hazards in order to have time to plan your way out of an emergency. Remember, always leave yourself enough. I should have taught you that when you're driving your car. When you see hazard, think about the emergencies that could develop and figure out what you would do. Always be prepared to take action. Always, always have that, always have that plan. Always be thinking ahead. So there's really not a whole lot of time to be complacent and playing on your phone in this business, is there? No. Nope, not at all. Distracted driving, we just kind of talked about that. What are some things, well, you can see the things here that are going to be distracted driving. Think. How many of you in this room think you have never drove distracted? Good. No one's hand came up, we're all on the same page. Fantastic. So when you're eating your sandwich, you're drinking your, your coffee in the morning, you're listening to the radio, you kind of zone out because it's a good song. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, you're changing the radio. You're talking to someone in the car. Even though you get a hands-free set, you're talking to someone on the phone. You're zoned out. You're half awake. You're thinking about work. You're reading the paper. All of these things are distracting. Okay, Cell phones are the worst, but there's a lot of things that we do as distracted drivers out there. As a professional driver, you're always not going to be distracted. You're going to try not to be distracted and watch for the people that are distracted. So we're always looking, always, always looking. And you'll see them. Trust me, they'll be down there at their phones like this. You've seen them, right? I'm sure you've all seen them. Okay. So uh, don't drive distracted. Uh, if a driver's react a half a second slower because of distractions, crashes double. Think about that. Half a second crashes double. <coughs> Some tips to follow there. Um, the yep, yeah, that'll be on the test, I'm sure. The review, be totally familiar with all safety and usage features on any in vehicle electronics, including wireless phones, GPS units, radio, stuff like that. Anybody ever get into a rental vehicle or a brand new car and you're trying to figure out the radio as you're driving down the road? Yeah, do that before you drive down the road, folks. It, it may work better. Pre-program your radio stations, preload your favorite CDs, whatever it is, and clear the vehicle of any unnecessary objects. You know, review your route, stuff like that. Use of uh, in-vehicle communication equipment, use that cautiously. Do you think we'll have to deal with that in the busing industry here? Yeah, I'm sure you will. At some point, I'm, I'm assuming they still got radios in them at some point, right? Mm -hmm. So use it cautiously. I will say this, anything you do other than drive your vehicle, do it cautiously. So 
So if you have to check on your passengers, do that cautiously, but remember, driving is a primary. Someone who's trying to reach out to you on a two-way radio, or you have a cell phone going off or something going on, your driving is primary, all that is secondary. Okay? Even if you have a hands-free set in your own personal vehicle, think about this, hands-free set, you're in a conversation, things are getting really busy in front of you, don't be afraid to say, I'll call you back, click, done. Right? Some of us don't do that though, we try and talk as we're going through, don't do that. Mm -hmm. All right? Any questions on any of that stuff? We all understand cell phones are a big no-no. Great. What's the fine in your car? If you could call the cell phone usage in your car. Yeah, about 300, 350, right in that area. Do you know what it is in a commercial vehicle? It's the same fine, okay, as a car. And we add another $2,750 civil fine on top of that. Don't play the game, folks. Okay, watch out for other distracted drivers. We talked about that. Aggressive driving versus road rage. Let's talk about this. So, aggressive driving. Here's how you distinguish between the two. The aggressive driver is the driver that is breaking vehicle and traffic laws. They have no target in mind. They're just a poor driver. They're in a hurry. They don't care about anybody else. They just need to get where they're going. Bad driver, that's it. That's the aggressive driver. Will that driver cut you off? No. Absolutely. Will that driver run a stop sign? No. Absolutely. Will they pass you in a no passing zone? Absolutely. It's an aggressive driver, okay? Be aware of them, just don't have an accident. It's a lot of paperwork. Road rage, change this up. Road rage is an emotional state of anger. This is a difference, huge difference, because now they're looking to vent the anger. They're looking for a target. You may be that target. So do you understand the difference here? Instead of just breaking vehicle and traffic laws, what type of laws is the road rage driver breaking? Uh, penal law, right? Criminal laws? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking jail time here, folks. Don't engage in that. But do you understand the difference now between the aggressive driver and the road rage driver? Okay. Can an aggressive driver turn into a road rage driver? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So make sure that we're aware of all those situations going in. We don't want to encourage that. Should we ever engage either one? No. 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 Should we pull off into a dark area where there's no lights and be alone? No. no. <laughs> Think about this, right? Okay. Now, aggressive driver, if you call that in a 911 call, is that a legal 911 call? The aggressive driver? No. no. Now, what if it's a road rage driver? Is that a legal call? Yes. That is a legal phone call, folks. There you go. Yeah, it's on the right side there, there's a little cable. Sorry about that. Thank you for giving me that. Any questions on the aggressive driver versus road rage? Okay. They will ask you questions about this. That's the difference though. Alright? I'm gonna brush through over this now. When you're in, when you're confronted by these people, again, avoid eye contact. Don't engage them. Don't do anything with it. Just be the professional. There's nothing to win here. There's everything to lose here. Okay? Okay. Move on to night driving. Has anyone in here not drove at night? Okay, so we understand the hazards here, right? Great. So less visibility. Can't see things as well. The glare on the windshields, the people's headlights, stuff like that. Okay. Same thing in the truck. Same thing in the bus. It's all the same. So with vision, again, make sure you dim your lights, don't be blinding others. The glare is always an issue, all right? So older drivers have a tendency to be a little bit more bothered by it, but either way, you don't want anybody uh, being blinded by you. So fatigue, uh, oh, oh, this is important here. Don't look directly at the lights when driving. Look at the right side of the road, called the fog line. Every now and then, I just want to make sure I know everybody said you know, understood it, but you look at the fog line. The fog line is the white line on the right side of the road. Look away from the lights. Don't look into them. Fatigue and lack of alertness. Um, fatigue and lack of alertness are bigger problems at night. Again, people are ready to go to sleep at night most times, so you got to watch out for those drivers that are falling asleep at the wheel. Make sure you're dealing with their fatigue. And watch out for you. You know, If you're going to try and drive through the night, that ain't a good idea. You will get tired. If your body's used to going to bed at 11 o'clock, it's going to bed at 11 o'clock. You're better off to pull over and get a little bit of sleep. Okay? 
When it comes to fatigue, are we better off with a 10 minute coffee break or a 10 minute nap? Yeah. 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 10 minute nap, okay? Roadway factors, uh, do I need to talk about poor lighting? Nope, okay. Drunk drivers, we already talked about drunk drivers. Any more questions on that? Okay, let's move into the headlights. This is stuff here you will need to know. Okay. At night, your headlights will usually be the main source of light for you to see and for others to see. You can't see nearly as much. Uh, so with low beams on, you can normally see about 250 feet in front of you. That's where your low beams are supposed to kind of cover. High beams are gonna take you up to about 350 to 500 feet. That's what they should be covering. So you need to know those numbers a little bit. You must adjust your speed to keep your stopping distance within your sight distance. Light driving can be more dangerous. Dirty headlights, what happens when you have dirty headlights? You can't see as much. Yeah, you can't see as much, right? So make sure they're clean. What about a dirty windshield? You can't see as much, and then when the headlights do hit your windshield, what does it do? It makes it almost impossible to see through. Okay, so make sure that you're paying attention to all this stuff. Now, um, other lights, reflectors, marker lights, clearance lights, make sure they're clean. And that's part of your pre-trip and then route inspection and post-trip. Make sure everything's cleaned up pretty good. Turn signals and brake lights, make sure they're working. Windshield and mirrors, you know, make sure that they're clean and adjusted. Everything's in good working order. Now, we all know how to use washer fluid, right? Okay. If we have the days where there's a lot of slush on the road and it's that really nasty slush, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm. We're constantly using those wipers, but it's not really enough to wash the window. It's like, okay, fine, I gotta use my washer fluid to clean them a little bit. Those are the days you wanna carry a little bit of extra washer fluid with you maybe, depending on your routes, depending on what you're doing in commercial industry here. I mean, I've had times where I come from Albany to Buffalo and I use seven gallons, mm. okay? So you really wanna make sure that you don't run out because that's kind of a critical thing. It's nothing worse than a messed up windshield that you can't see it. So there's your pre-trip procedures. You do it the same. Uh, just make sure it's clean, topped up, and ready to go. Avoid blinding others. This is something you'll need here. The last sentence here. We understand high beams, but dim your lights before they cause glare for other drivers. Dim your lights within 500 feet of an oncoming vehicle and when following another vehicle within 500 feet. Remember yesterday I said 500 feet, that's the magic number. Because remember they talked about flashing the lights? A lot of people know we're passing or coming around that didn't see us. You can't flash more than 500 feet. Anybody ever flash the lights for letting them know there's a cop ahead? Yeah. Everybody have that, you light, light them up and it's actually another cop coming at you? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever do that or is that just me? No. no. <laughs> All right, so again, don't flash your high beams within 500 feet of anybody. You'll blind them and that's a bad scenario. What if you have the driver coming at you and their high beams are on and they're within that 500 feet? Should you still try and flash them a little bit? No. Not at all, because if you flash them with your, with your high beams, what does that create now? Well, with just their headlights coming at you and high beam, you're kind of blinded. So we have one blind driver. You hit your high beam switch, what did that do to the other driver? Now we have two blind people coming at each other. You see how that kind of goes wrong? That's why we don't do this, okay? So avoid the glare, we know how to look to the right side of the fog line. Use high beams whenever it's safe and legal to do so. That'll be a question on the test. So you always wanna try and use them as much as you can, but just not within 500 feet of anybody else. Great, how far do your low beams show you? 250, what do your high beams cover footage wise? 350 to 500, and you have to have your headlights, high beams dimmed within how many feet? 500, okay, driving in the fog. What's the best way to drive in the fog? Low beam. You don't. That's the best way, you don't. <laughs> Swear to God, that's, that's the best. Okay, now I've drove in fog, I've drove in freezing fog, I've drove in places where you lost the hood of the truck. Bad places, and, and that's a very dangerous thing. So one, if it's fog warnings, heed the warning. Pay attention when it's fog and it's that time of year. Heed the warnings, you know your driving times versus that fog time. Sometimes you're better off just waiting an extra hour and not going into that fog, because that fog will lift as soon as that sun starts to hit it. Slow down before a fog. Use your low beams, why don't we use high beams? 
Because remember, it's water, right? That's what fog is. So if we put more light into that, we're gonna have a lot more light reflecting back at us. Mm -hmm. And low beams point lower, so the reflection comes back lower on the vehicle. Your high beams point higher, which means the reflection will come back higher on the vehicle. Make sense? There you go. If you have uh, fog lights, use them. If you're slow, okay, it's hard to see, what should we turn on? Four ways, Four ways right? Get that little flash of light thing going on. Watch for vehicles on the other side of the roadway. Sometimes you just see taillights, you think they're moving, that's where you get rear-ended, so again, be careful with that. And here's the problem with the fog. If you can't see to drive through the fog, you don't dare pull off either. Because if you pull off, people are thinking you're slow moving, you get rear-ended. So you can't really see a whole lot. That's why it's really a bad idea to drive in. Uh, listen for traffic you can't see it, avoid passing anybody, and don't stop along the side of the road during that situation. Any questions on fog? Driving in the winter, I know we're in Buffalo, so we never get snow or bad weather. So this may be new to some of you. <laughs> By the way, this weekend, folks, if you ain't watching the weather reports, this weekend, we're getting it. Not a lot, what, three to five or something like that, we can call it? Okay. Same as everything else, do your pre-trip inspection, make sure your cold level and antifreeze is the proper level. Make sure your defroster and heater's working. It's kind of an important thing. Wash your windows. If you haven't noticed, a dirty inside window fogs faster and stays fogged up longer than if it was clean. If it's clean, it clears off really quickly. Wipers and washers, make sure that they work. Okay. And let's see, tires. If I need to talk about tires, make sure you have enough tread. What's the tread depth we need for steer tires? 430 seconds, remember 432? Yep. What about the, the drive tires and all the tires? Yeah. 230 seconds, very good. Tire chains, does everybody understand what tire chains are? Tire chains are chains that we would mount to the tire and it gives us extra traction, okay? And there's regulations as to where and how and when and all that stuff that we can use them. And uh, some vehicles have automatic chainers and stuff like that, but just understand it's there to increase your traction. Okay? Lights and reflectors, make sure they stay cleared off. One of the things that we'll you notice in the winter time is people don't stop to clear off their lights. They'll be driving down the road, next thing you know, Perfect. The whole back of the vehicle is gone in a white blizzard, right? Stop every once in a while. Go into the gas station. Clean everything off so people can see you and you can be seen. Windows and mirrors, again, make sure they stay clear of stuff. Hand holds, steps, and deck plates. Well, what could go wrong with that stuff? A lot of slippery stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, you, your bus, your vehicle's a little higher up. You kind of take a fall off of that? That hurts, mm -hmm. okay? telling you right now that hurts. So be very cautious of that. And you're gonna be in the bus industry here, so make sure that it's clear, because if you have people getting on and off the bus, you, know, you don't want them to slip and fall either. So you start getting a lot of slush, and I'm sure they'll cover it with you and all that, but always be aware, because the driver is always the one responsible. Remember that? <laughs> you're always responsible for every aspect, okay? Radiator shutters and winter fronts, does everybody understand what this is about? Okay, your vehicle is designed on airflow. We need air coming through the radiator to cool off the fluid that's in the radiator. The fluid that's in the radiator is circulating through the engine to keep the engine cool, okay? If, if it's too cold out, okay? That air is too cold coming through the radiator, cools that fluid too much, is that okay for the engine? No, because the engine's running too cold. We want it to be at a normal operating range. And then the same aspect, we want to make sure that it gets enough airflow because in the winter time, we can have snow and ice start to build up on the radiator, right? Mm -hmm. If that builds up on the radiator and plugs off the radiator, what happens? Overheat. Yeah, we could actually overheat in this winter time. It could be negative two degrees and we're overheating. Okay. Exhaust systems. Why do we want to make sure there's no leaks in the exhaust system? Poison. Yeah, it's kind of a dangerous thing, right? What are the signs? Just out of curiosity, I know it's a little side thing, but I think it's kind of worth it. Um, what are the signs when you have that uh, poisoning coming through, carbon monoxide poisoning? Headache. Yeah, you start getting headaches? Yeah. What else? Drowsiness. Drowsiness? What else? Dizziness. Dizziness. Smell sometimes. Sleeping. Mm -hmm. Sleeping. Mm -hmm. What about yawning? Mm -hmm. Does everybody know what yawning is? I got a question. Is it all goes in the normal like, side? Well, I can't do this little any other time. 
world's normal. You can, but when you start feeling them all about the same time, it's not normal in that scenario. So what is yawning? Why do we yawn? Yeah, a lack of oxygen to the brain. So you find yourself yawning a lot in a truck or in a vehicle, even in your car, pay attention to this, you start yawning a lot, you're like, oh my God, I can't stop yawning. Check the circulation, make sure you get the oxygen flow within the vehicle, you may have a little bit low oxygen count within the vehicle, okay? If you have fumes coming up in the vehicle, that could kill it too. Okay, you're walking through the warehouse, there's a lot of tow motors and stuff going around. Next thing you know, you're yawning, you're getting a headache, you're like, oh, it could be a lot of lack of oxygen in that area. So you really pay attention to this stuff. Watch your body. Driving, slippery surfaces. Okay, we talked about that. Remember running in slippery shoes? We handle winter the same way, okay? So slippery surfaces, I'm not gonna go much deeper into that. You start gentle and slow, okay? How well does it work if you try and run on ice right away? No. Yeah, we're in Western New York, that don't work so good, right? We've all tried that once, maybe about that big. Okay, check for ice. So make sure you're watching the roadways, watching the mirrors, adjust your turning and braking to conditions. Remember, we slowed down early, make sure we turn gently, adjust your speed, always adjust your speed. We talked yesterday about the ice and the wet ice and stuff like that. Slow that vehicle down. When in doubt, slow it down. Okay. Adjust the speed, adjust space to conditions. Again, leave extra following distance. Give yourself a lot of room to do what you need to do. Wet brakes. Hmm. What do wet brakes do? What do they feel like? Spongy. They start to squeak a little bit, but what else? They can lock up, right? They can grab and lock up. That can be very dangerous, so make sure that that's not happening. All right? How do we test that? Just No, no, just a real light application and be ready for it. You just kind of warm up a little bit, because when you come out of water sometimes, let's say like this weather here, where we start getting more rain, there's yeah. water puddling on the road, you're not sure if the brakes are gonna work, don't wait until you get to a stop to test them. Okay, get out of the water, just ease onto that brake, make sure the brakes are working and make sure they're not grabbing. That's how we test it, okay? And plus that light application is gonna do what to the temperature of the brakes? Increase them, right? And what will that do to the moisture? Dry them out and dissipate it, right? Fantastic. Moving on. How are we doing on the time? Oh, we're pretty close. Then we're about 10 after six. We've been at this about an hour. I may have bored the living daylights out of you, so let's take a few minute break really quick. Back into this, avoid driving through deep puddles of flowing water if possible. If not, you should slow down, place your transmission into a lower gear, okay? Gently put on the brakes, and this presses uh, the lines against the drums and this to keep the mud, salt, and sand out as you're going through. So what they're saying is we're going to slow down before we get to the water. Okay, one, you should never go to water. But if you had to, let's say it's a little puddles or something in the street here. Slow it down, use a lower gear, and slightly have that brake applied going through the water. It keeps the, the shoes and drums together, keeps all the twigs and dirt and mud and all that stuff out. Plus it warms them up, keeps them working. Increase engine RPM as you go across the water. When you're out of the water, maintain light pressure. Again, that's going to dissipate the moisture. Make a test stop. Already talked about that, just that light brake application, make sure they're working. <coughs> Driving in very hot weather. Vehicle checks, normal pre-trip inspection, a few extra things we look at here. What are the tires? If you remember yesterday, we talked about making the stop to check the brake, right? First one is 50 miles, so in the first hour. Normal driving is 150 miles or three hours. Adverse conditions, which would include hot weather, now we're talking every two hours or 100 miles, okay? <coughs> if they get too hot, just stop the truck, let them cool down. Engine oil. Engine oil helps keep the engine cool as well. So make sure you have the proper level of engine oil within your engine. Engine cooling, before starting up, make sure the engine cooling <coughs> system has enough water, antifreeze according to the engine manufacturer's directions. Again, make sure you watch the temperature gauge and all that stuff as you're going out. <coughs> Stop driving as soon as safely possible and it starts getting uh, too warm. So, excuse me, some vehicles have sight glasses that you can check the reservoir. Never remove the cap. I mean, we want to highlight this. This will be on the test. <coughs> Never remove the cap of a, a radiator, any part of the pressurized system, because that whole thing is under pressure. 
Okay? So if you take that cap off, where's that fluid going to go? Even though it's a two phase cap, it's going to splatter all over you and it burns really bad fast. So again, don't do that. Let the system depressurize, let it all cool down, and then remove the cap later. Always have a glove on and a regular tap. You had a question? Uh, yeah. Um, what part do you want to tie this part right here, right where it says never remove the radiator cap or any part of the pressurized system until the system is cooled. Okay? Again, that's a very dangerous thing. That's why we're making sure and they will ask that question on the test. Okay, if the coolant has to be added, shut the engine off, wait till everything's cooled. Again, use your, your gloves and cloth. Turn the radiator cap the first click, the double click or double pressured. So you, you do the first click, that's going to release the pressure to hold the cap in place. But be careful, because if there's still pressure there, it'll still throw the fluid out at you. Step back, let the pressure continue out. When all the pressure's off, then you can remove the cap and, and drive cord or add fluid accordingly. Engine belts. Okay, learn how to check the tightness of the belts. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, the V belt. A V belt is shaped in the, like a V. Okay, and it goes down into the pulley, and normally they're a little bit narrower belt. You'll see them like on more lawnmower dacks, you'll see them on snow blower, stuff like that. Some of your cars you look, you might see them on the yellow Versus a serpentine belt. A serpentine belt is a flat belt, it's a little bit wider, it has little grooves in it. Okay, so when you see the serpentine thing, tongue and groove, the V is just sits right in the slot in the V, and that's all it is. Both of them should not have more than three quarters of an inch plane. Should not have play in those belts and it shouldn't be corroded in any way. Hoses, make sure the coolant hoses are in good condition. It's a rubber hose. What are we looking for? Cracks. Cracks. Holes. Holes. Leaks. Leaks. Mm -hmm. What about bulges? Absolutely. You'll find a lot of times they'll start to bulge right near where the clamps are because if they put the clamp on too tight, it compromises the integrity of the rubber and they'll start to expand and normally bubble right in that spot. So watch your, your hoses when they start to bulge. Bleeding tar. Okay, what's bleeding tar? Have you ever heard of this one? Okay, basically your road is made up of a couple compositions here, right? Tar and stone in a very simple format. Okay, what happens when it gets too hot, the tar turns like a liquid, but the road will separate and it'll start to bubble up. So you get like a tar slick on top, it'll look like a black patch of tar. Is that slippery, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a Okay, so be very cautious on that. Go slow enough to prevent overheating. This question will be on the test as well. High speeds create more heat for tires and the engine. In desert conditions, the heat may build up to the point where it's dangerous. The heat will increase chances of tire failure, or even uh, fire and engine uh, failure. So the question will be like this. Are we better off driving faster in the heat and having more air come through the engine through the radiator, or are we better off driving slower and have less friction in the block? No, drive slower. Okay, everyone with me on that? That'll be a question there somewhere. Moving on. We're doing pretty good here, folks. Railroad, highway, grade crossings. Okay, when it comes to railroads, there are two types. There's passive and there's active. That doesn't mean one has trains, one don't, okay? Passive. Passive means there's no lights, there's no arms or any of that stuff. It's just what's called the cross box, which are those two white boards that form the X and says railroad on it. That's it, that's a passive track. There's no alarms, no lights, no armature, just the warning. Now, active tracks, active tracks have the armatures, okay? Or they have a light system or a combination thereof. And you'll hear the bell, ding, 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 ding. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. That's the difference between the two. Most of your tracks out there are passive. That's the bulk of them. Okay. So understand your tracks. There's your warning device, advanced warning signs, or just signs saying, hey, you've got railroad tracks coming up. Pavement markings, we've all seen this, right? It's a white, white lines in the ground there. Great, moving on. It's also a no passing zone, so don't pass someone going over railroad track. Bad idea. The cross box, there's the, a good sign of the cross box, a good picture of the cross box. When you see the cross box, underneath that, you're going to see how many tracks there are. So if there's one set of tracks, two set of tracks, three sets of tracks, generally if there's nothing there, it's just one set of tracks. If there's two or more, they start labeling, hey, we got two sets of tracks here, we got three sets of tracks. 
know what you have because that's extra distance that you have to cross to get across them. All right? And if you have two sets of tracks, you may have a train coming from one side and go, oh, that one's clear, and not be able to see the one coming from the opposite direction. Always make sure you're aware of those scenarios. Any questions on the red flashing lights? Okay. The red, red lights come on, train's coming. Never try to race the train. What about the gates? What's up with the gates here? If the great gates come down, can we kind of get around them if it's enough time? No. no. Exactly, so don't do that. The gates are coming down, bring it to a stop. Never race a train, reduce speed. I'm going kind of fast, but I think this should be kind of common core knowledge. Mm -hmm. A little bit of common sense. Everybody here is still alive, so I think you may have passed some of this stuff. Um, reduce the speed, pay attention. Don't expect to hear a train. Don't rely on the signals. And double tracks require double checking. Yard areas and gate crossings and, and cities and towns are especially an issue. Any questions on that? So that's why, according to federal law, we have to open up our window and listen for the train. Because according to federal law, the train has to blow its horn before it crosses the roadway. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. Your buses may stop and have to open up the door. We have to really make sure that this is clear and we look, because we may not hear the horn. Okay, a full stop is required at grade crossings whenever the nature of the cargo makes the stop mandatory under state and federal laws. If you're hauling people, do you think it's mandatory? Yes, yeah. passengers and hazmat are the two things that make this mandatory. Okay. Such a stop will otherwise be required by law. When stopping, be sure to check traffic behind you while you're stopping. Also use a pullout lane if available and turn on your four-way flashers. Okay. Crossing the tracks, uh, make sure your railroad crossings with steep approaches can cause your vehicle to hang out. Make sure you clear that. Never permit traffic conditions to trap you on the tracks. So don't cross into those tracks unless you know you can get all the way past them. Remember yesterday we said we want to clear those tracks by 15 feet, right? All right. Don't can shift gears. What did you just say? 15 feet. So you have the, the rail. You're going to be at least 15 feet away from either rail. Okay. So when you're coming up to stop near the railroad tracks, don't get any closer than 15 feet. It's always 15 to 50 where we're stopping. And when we decide we're going across, make sure that you can clear the last rail with the tail of your vehicle by at least 15 feet. Okay. Don't shift while you're on the tracks. Be aware of special conditions like your low hung trailers or single axle tractors because it allows the landing gear to get too low. If for any reason you get stuck on the tracks, call 911 or an emergency number that's posted there by the tracks. Any questions about railroad tracks? Okay. One thing in here I wanted to, this may be on the test. I'm just gonna note it, okay? Be sure you can get all the way across the tracks before you start across. It takes a typical Tractor trailer, 14 seconds to clear a single track and more than 15 seconds to clear a double track. Do we understand that? We're talking about these fully loaded tractor trailers, these big trucks, 14 to 15 seconds is really where we're at. So 14 on a single, 15 on a double. All right. Any, any questions? We're good with the railroad thing? Okay. We're going to be talking about that a little bit more, but. Let's get through this now, mountain driving. We've already talked about a lot of mountain driving stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the question that they're going to get into and it takes mountains or downhill grades. They want to know if you know the difference between brake fade and brake failure. There's a difference. Okay, so <coughs> let's go slow enough to prevent the fade. <coughs> fade, brake fade is when you are pushing harder and harder on the brake pedal to get the same braking application. That's brake fade. So you're pushing harder and you're pushing harder and you're pushing harder and just to try and maintain the same braking. <coughs> now, brake failure, what do you think that is? Nothing. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> it's over, we're done. Okay? Step down the brake, there's nothing there. We, we've got a bad day at work, okay? That's the difference between the two. Can brake fade turn into brake failure? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So select to save speed, we've already talked about this. We talked about how to go down the hill. Remember the select the right gear prior to the hill. Use the uh, uh, braking effect of the engine before you use the brakes of the vehicle. So you get a low gear, let the engine go up to higher RPM, step on the brakes, slow it down five miles per hour, and keep repeating that process. Okay, that's how we get down the grade. Now, I haven't seen this question in a while, and those of you that have already taken the test a little bit, you may want to check it on this, but I'm going to make the statement anyway, just in case. 
With older trucks, a rule for choosing the gear is to use the same gear going down that you would use to climb it. Newer trucks, we use a lower gear than what it would take to climb it. Why? Because the horsepower, the aerodynamics and stuff like that, okay? If the question's not on there, just know that the newer trucks take a lower gear than it would take to climb. The older trucks, it's the same, okay? Moving on. We just talked about brake fade versus brake failure. Any questions on that? Okay. There's your proper braking technique. Um, two, sixteen, four. That's your on again, off again. There's your five mile an hour. So that whole section right there under remember, that whole one, two, three thing, that's what they're after. Escape ramps. I bet you there's going to be a question on the <laughs> test about escape ramps. Why? Because we've had some issues recently. Does everyone know what an escape ramp is? An escape ramp, when you're going down a mountainside or down a hillside, they are the, the areas that you can turn out and they generally will stop your vehicle. So they, they're soft stones or sand, and a lot of times they'll use the hill, they'll aim back uphill. They're designed to stop your vehicle if your brakes fade or fail. Okay, any braking area, braking issue at all, should you hesitate to use those escape ramps if your brakes are having an issue? Nope, and it goes. Okay? Don't be afraid to use it, but that's what they're for. You know where they are along your route, and hopefully if you do this right, there won't be an issue. But don't be afraid to use them. Driving emergencies. Okay, traffic emergencies occur when two vehicles are about to collide. Vehicle emergencies occur when tires, brakes, or other critical parts fail. Do you understand the difference in the term there? Vehicle versus traffic. Traffic is more than one vehicle. The vehicle is just you solo. Okay? Steering to avoid a crash. All right, this will be on the test. So stopping is not always the safest thing to do in an emergency. <coughs> if you don't have enough room to stop, you may have to steer away from what's ahead. Remember, you can almost always turn to miss an obstacle more quickly than you can stop. That's going to be on there somewhere, folks. Okay, we just talked about that one today and yesterday, so. All right, moving on, keep both hands on the steering wheel. How to do this here? Keep both hands on the wheel, so don't be doing the one-handed, hey, hang on to my beer, watch this thing, don't be doing that. Two hands on the wheel, firmly gripped. How to turn quickly and safely? Do not apply the brakes while you're turning, okay? It could cause your vehicle to skid and lose control. Do not turn any more than what's needed to clear the obstacle. So if you're gonna move over two feet, just move over two feet, don't move over 20. Be prepared to counter steer. Does everyone understand what counter steering is? So we steer for the emergency and then we counter steer to bring it back. Are they with me on that? So we steer into the drift if we start to skid and then we counter steer as it straightens up. That's counter steering, okay? Where to steer? If an oncoming driver has drifted into your lane, this may be a question on the test. This has been time tested almost every permit. A move to your right is normally best. So even if they're in your lane, we go to the right because if they wake up, where are they gonna probably go? They're back into their lane. They're always gonna keep trying to go back to their lane. So we always try, try to keep going to the right. Okay, so again, if uh, something's blocking your path, you have to know your situation. Use your mirrors, you'll know what's going on. Use the shoulder if it's clear. If you're blocked on both sides, a move to the right may still be best, even if you have to force someone off into the ditch, or even if you take the ditch. Leaving the road, okie dokie. In some emergencies, you may have to drive off the road. It may be less risky than facing a collision with another vehicle. Most shoulders are strong enough to support the weight of a large vehicle. So they're gonna talk about that on the permit. Remember, this is the permit test. This is engineers, this is DMV talking. Just remember that when you do this, okay? After you get your permit in hand, license in hand, then we talk about something else. But for the permit, most shoulders are strong enough to support the weight of a large vehicle and therefore offer an available skate, escape route. So here's some things if you do leave the road. One, avoid braking, okay? Because if you hit loose dirt, loose stones, loose anything, you hit those brakes and we're steering, what can we do? Skid or lose control, right? So we avoid all the braking until it gets down to about 20 mile an hour. Just let the vehicle ride itself down. Try to keep at least one set of tires up on the pavement. That gives you better steering control. 
and then you stay on the shoulder until everything is cleared and you've come to a stop. Okay, so once you get below that 20, we just ease into the brake. What they want is if we had to leave the road, you're looking to stop the vehicle. Get your bearings again. Get everything kind of working again, because you might be a little bit shook up. Don't make bad decisions. That's the main objective here. Now, returning to the road. Well, once you get stopped, we say no, move back out. However, sometimes you may be forced to return right away. We got off and, oh boy, we gotta hurry up and get back on, right? We've seen that? Okay. You wanna hold the wheel tightly and use a sharp enough to just jump that vehicle back on. It's just a nice pop it on type of thing. Don't try and ease it on is what they're trying to say. Don't ease it on. Because if you're easing it on and you have a drop off a good six inches, it can take that front tire and pop that tire right off the rim, okay? Plus, a lot of those shoulders are not straight. So if they're paved crooked, you won't know when that tire's gonna grab and jump on and you could lose control. So what we do is we steer it back on, okay? Now that's a steer, counter steer movement, right? We would steer it to get it on and then we would counter steer to straighten it out. Everybody understand that? That's what they're gonna ask here. Once both front tires are on the pavement, that's when we do the counter steer. Emergency braking. Okay. Emergency braking. Keep this separate in your mind from standard issue braking. Okay? Emergency braking means we have an emergency and we need to really use these brakes excessively. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. Control braking. This is what you should be doing in your car. You get on the brake aggressively, as hard as you can, without locking the wheels up, right? Everybody understand that? Because the goal is to not lock the wheels. Skidding tires actually go faster. So our goal is to not skid the tires. That's why we have ABS. And if you hit the tires hard enough on your car with that control braking, you'll feel the ABS kick in, right? Sometimes the pedal feels a little flutter to it, depending on your vehicle. That's what we're doing in these trucks, because these trucks and buses have ABS on them. Get on that brake aggressively without locking tires. If the tires lock, what do we do? Back off. Release the brake, let them get moving, back into a control braking. Versus stab braking. Stab braking is brake until you feel them lock, then release. Brake, lock them up, and release. Brake, lock them up, and release. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. If we have ABS, isn't that doing the same thing as stab braking? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's what ABS is. It's the electronic version of stab braking, except it can do it like 100 times faster than your foot can. That's why we have ABS. So if you have ABS, should we ever really be using stab braking then? No, no the electronics are already doing it for us. If your ABS malfunctions, well, maybe that may be one of your options. Then. So that's a good thing in your front brake spots. Yes, okay. yep. What that's doing is it's controlling and not allowing the tires to skid, which means you'll normally stop and better control. But some people think if you get a tire skid, it, it's helping, but it's not. It's not, it's actually making it worse. Oh. Now, ABS does not mean you're gonna stop in a shorter distance. It means you're gonna have better control through the stop. Okay, that's, we'll get into ABS here in a little while, but just understand that too. So, don't just jam on the brakes. That's one thing that they're gonna ask on the test. Should you just jam on the brakes? Lock them all up. No, that's the worst thing you can do. Don't ever do it. Brake failure, we talked about that, right? Brake failure is not fake. Brake failure is, hey, we don't have brakes. Whatever caused it, caused it. It could be brake fade, it could be a malfunction in the system, whatever it is. Now remember, if we're in general knowledge, what type of system are we in? Hydraulics. Hydraulics, so relate this to your car. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Do you all have emergency brakes? Emergency brakes? Yeah, we have emergency brakes. But, but emergency brakes, when you get into your car, how does your car emergency brakes work? So your emergency brakes normally apply a brake to the back axle, right? Okay, so if we were to just slam on that emergency brake cable, we could actually put that vehicle into a skid, right? So we'd have to ease on to that. That is one of the options. If we lose brakes in the, in the hydraulic system, ease on to that emergency brake, okay? Air brakes are gonna to be totally different, okay? Any questions on that? Did I answer your question? You ride it out. You're gonna ride it out. If you have that, you can use a little bit of that emergency brake, but just don't jam it on. We're gonna get into the, the downshifting right here. You see the next three bullets downshift, pump the brakes and use the brake pedal, the parking brake. We're gonna get into that. But the first thing here, I just want to make sure everybody understands what brake failure is first. Okay. 
Loss of hydraulic pressure. First thing we would do is look for downshifting. We're gonna use that engine compression to slow us down. And then we're gonna start pumping the brakes. Because when you pump the brakes, especially in the newer systems, they have valves in there that were closed off. And you might be able to build up enough pressure to at least reduce some of the speed, okay? And then we can ease on the parking brake. But again, remember how that parking brake system is working. It's normally attached to a cable towards the back of the vehicle. So that, when you apply it, if you just jam it on, you'll put the vehicle into a skid. You just want to ease that brake pedal, or your parking brake, very gently. Find an escape route. You know, we talked about brake failure. There was nothing in here that said we're on a downhill. Don't assume in a question on this test. Brake failure is brake failure. It doesn't mean you're on a grade. It doesn't mean you're not on a grade. It just means you lost your brakes. Don't overread your questions. Okay? Find an escape route. So if we're having a tough time stopping it, maybe an open field, stuff like that. If it's an escape ramp, use that. You know, anytime your brakes fail, we're looking to get that vehicle to a stop as soon and as safely as possible. Okay. Brake failure on downgrades. We've already talked about that. Any questions on that? Jump in the escape ramp. Okay, if you don't have an escape ramp, the least hazardous <laughs> escape route you can use. Um, going into a flat field, stuff like that, running it into a ditch line, letting the like soft dirt kind of slow you down. Obviously turn into the mountainside instead of off the mountainside, you know, simple things like that. The key to the whole thing is don't lose in the beginning. This is part of the pre-trip, this is part of you maintaining proper braking technique, this is you doing the professional thing. Most of the time it won't be a problem. Tire failure. Okay, think about this in your car, it's all the same, okay? If we have tire failure, here are some things that we, we might understand as being tire failure. One, there's a sound, we hear bang, tire blew out, okay? On the commercial vehicle, there's a lot more air pressure on them, it's gonna be a louder bang. If you ever had that going down the freeway and had one blow next to you, it's a very loud bang. Vibration. You may feel the wheel vibrating. You may feel your vehicle vibrating. It's kind of like a pump, 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 okay? And feel feels heavy, maybe pulling one side or the other. The vehicle feels, feels heavy left or right, okay? If the tires fail, if you have a tire failure, one, hold the steering wheel firmly. Two, stay off of the brake. Remember you talked about momentum? Remember that yesterday we talked about momentum? So here's the thing. If you blow, let's say, a front tire, the momentum is going from a forwards momentum to a sidewards momentum because the vehicle is going to droop. Everybody with me on that? We're good? If we hit the brake, what does it do to that momentum then? If we hit the brake, we let off, it goes that direction even more. So we counter that by stepping on the throttle. We're not going zero to 60 and 3.0 here, folks, okay? All we're doing is countering the sidewards momentum and bringing it back more towards a forward momentum until we can get control of the steering wheel better. Once we have control of the steering wheel, now we can ease off of that throttle and let that vehicle slow itself down on its own merit. Just gonna let it ride itself down. Any questions on that? ABS, any questions on ABS? Does ABS mean you can stop your vehicle in a shorter time on normal braking? No, okay? It's preventing your skid, giving you better control of the vehicle. If your ABS system is malfunctioning, well, how will you identify that? Light. The light comes on, right? Malfunction light comes on. If that comes on, what should we do? Get it fixed, right? There you go. Does that mean you don't have brakes though? No, we still have brakes, we just don't have the computer system doing that for us. Now, let's talk about the parts of that really quick. You understand how ABS works. ABS has an ECU, the electronic control unit. It's kind of like the brains of the operation. And then at each wheel, there's a sensor and it's reading that wheel going around. Kind of like dot, dash, dot, dash, dot, dash. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. So when you step on the brake, it's reading all four of those sensors and all those dot dashes are coming to the ECU. If one of those goes dot and stays there, that tells the computer, hey, that wheel's locking up. It's gonna release the braking application to that wheel. When it starts to move again, it goes back into normal braking. So that's how that works, okay? All right, moving on. Any questions? There's a sensor, we talked about that. Vehicles required to have ABS. There may be a question on this. I'm just gonna go over it so you understand. The Department of Transportation requires ABS to be on all truck tractors with air brakes built on or after March 1st, 1997. All air brake vehicles 
trucks, buses, trailers, and converter dollies built on or after March 1st, 1998. And all hydraulic brake trucks and buses with a gross vehicle weight rating of 10,000 pounds or more built on or after 1999. Any questions on that? So it's all done since the late 90s, sir. We've already talked about how to know if it has the ABS system in it because you have the malfunction lamp. You turn on the dash, turn everything on. Trailer that's on the left side, there's your ECU. We already talked about how it helps you, it keeps your vehicle from skidding the best it can and keeps it in a straight line as you're braking. Okay, because if we go into a skid, that vehicle will always, the skidding tire always tries to lead the vehicle. So if your back tire goes into a skid, it's going to try and come around. That's why it'll help maintain that vehicle in a straight line a lot better. ABS on the tractor only or only on the trailer. Having ABS on one versus the other, you know, you just do normal braking. Okay. And we're really not going to get into those scenarios, and I don't believe they're going to be asking questions about that scenario anymore on the test. I mean, that's been a long time, so. Braking with ABS, you just drive normally. Brake like you would normally brake. The only thing is we just don't need to do stab braking anymore because you know the electronics are doing it. Okay, there's one exception to this procedure. If you drive a straight truck or combination with working ABS on all axles and an emergency stop, you can fully apply the brakes. Remember that's called control braking. Okay? So that's when we get into control braking. Braking still is there if ABS isn't working. There's the won'ts. If you're not sure what the ABS won'ts do, it won't allow you to drive faster, won't prevent power from turning uh, skids. So when you're doing a turn, it's not gonna stop those. ABS won't necessarily shorten stopping distance, won't increase the distance, uh, the ultimate stopping power, won't change the way you normally brake, and won't compensate for bad brakes. Okay, any questions on that? Skid control and recovery. Okay, with skid control and recovery, Here's how I can tell you this, stop doing whatever caused it. Very simple. If it's an acceleration skid, stop accelerating. If it's a braking skid, stop braking. Very simple. These are uh, four ways here that we cause skids. One is over braking, the over steering, over acceleration, or driving too fast. And I'm sure we've all done that in our personal vehicles, correct? We may have already screwed that up, but we know how to fix it. We steer into the skid, and then we counter steer, we straighten out, and we stop doing whatever caused it. Should we ever hit a brake during a skid? No. no, be off the pedals, let it ride itself. Okay, um, so the drag wheel skids, we understand that. Okay, we're gonna talk about jackknifes here. Jackknife, that's a term used when a tractor and trailer come around and hit each other. Whatever caused it, whatever came out of the lineup, that's what we call the skid. So if it's a tractor skid, that means the tractor came out of the line and caused it to go together. If it's a trailer jackknife, that means the trailer came out of the lineup and caused the jackknife. Everybody understand? Mm -hmm. Remember, skidding tires will try to lead the vehicle. So if a trailer tire goes into a skid or trailer tires go into a skid, that trailer is going to try and lead the vehicle. If the drive tires go into a skid, the drive tires will lead the lineup and try to come around the vehicle. If the steer tires go into a skid, they're already in the front. So they will continue straight ahead, but they just won't turn left or right. You're just going to continue straight. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, and again, when you get those questions regarding that, think about your car. What would you do with your car? Correcting a drive wheel braking skid, stop braking, turn quickly, and counter steer. Okay. If you have a clutch system, you can push in the clutch. You know, take the power away from that. Front wheel skids, driving too fast for conditions is normally what causes those. That's a very common practice that, that happens. Well, you're gonna see the most common uh, front wheel skids is when you're coming into an intersection, you're going to try to turn left or right and the road's icy or slippery. You're going to turn your wheels and the vehicle's going to keep going straight. or slide right into the oncoming traffic. So be very cautious of that. Key to that is going slow enough before you start. Okay? Let's see. We're doing pretty good. We're almost there, folks. Actually, we're doing really good. Okay, crash procedures. Hopefully, you don't have to deal with a crash. Maybe someone else crashed when you're on the scene. Here is the list and the order of which we do things. They will ask you this on the test. These are the three bullets you will need to know. First thing you do is protect the area. That's the first thing you do. What does that mean? Anybody give you an example of that? Yeah, I, 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 
No, protect the seat first. Protect means get the triangles out. Don't cause another accident with your vehicle. Maybe block the seat so people can't hit the rest of the people laying in the road. It's protect the scene. Understand whatever you just saw in that accident or that crash already happened. What you're trying to do is prevent another one from happening or this one from getting worse. Does everybody understand? No ways that? Yeah. That's why we protect the area first. Second thing, just remember these people that are hurt, they're already hurt. The way to help them the best is don't hurt them more and get help on the way. So the second thing is notify the authorities. Get that phone call, get people on the way. The third thing on the list would be to go back and care for the injury. Do you understand why we take that process? So you kind of need to keep a cool head in the scenario, protect the scene, okay, which may only take a second or two, we're fine. Call the authorities, not a big call here. And then the care for the injured. When we notify the authorities, what's the important information to give them? Location. Location, okay. Care for the injured, should we go out and start moving people around, say, come on, get up, jog, jog around with me. No. Are they gonna be thinking straight? No. no. Keep them calm, keep them cool, or keep them covered, keep them warm, keep them just sitting still the best you can until the paramedics get there, people get there that can handle the scene. You had a question? So, what about in situations like when they have these uh, pileups in these places that the guy on the highway is like buying up the car pileups and stuff? Okay. What about it? Like you're talking about protect, <laughs> protect the area. Protect the scene. Protect the scene. My first thing, and when it comes to those, your way of protecting the scene as a professional driver is you never should have been there. Uh, truly, because a professional driver knows when to say, no, I'm not going out in that condition. Because they're reading the weather reports. They know the road conditions. They know the storm areas. They should never put themselves in that position. Secondly, when you're talking about protecting the scene, that scenario, your safest spot most of the time is staying in your vehicle. Okay? Let's say you did get stopped back far enough. Okay, you saw the accidents up there. You see everything going on. You got flares, put road flares out. Put your triangles out. Let people know, but you should really kind of stay in your vehicle under that particular scenario. If we're in dry roads, that's different, okay? You got fog. Now again, it's visibility. You make the traffic slow down. Let them warn them so they got enough time to slow down so we don't cause more accidents. That's really what it's about. Does that answer your question okay? Fine. Oh. No, you're, go ahead. I was just wondering because this is a topic. What is MSDA's policy to look after this or those road conditions from snowstorms? I have no idea. You don't have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> the reason being is because I didn't get you to pass it for me. That's my only goal. But I'll tell you why. There is no one out there that wants to have an accident. No company wants to have an accident. Okay? But they've been doing this for a long time. They know their roads, they know their equipment, they know the conditions. If you're having a problem with the conditions, communicate that with them. Let them know what's going on. I'm sure they have solutions to the situation. This is not something that's new to you, but it's not new to them. I am a little bit. Okay? So any questions on protecting the area? Putting your flashes out, triangles out, stuff like that. Notifying the authorities, whether it's via phone, whether it's CB, whatever works for you. Care for the injured. Don't move severely injured. Stop heavy bleeding by applying direct pressure on the wound and keep the injured person warm. Make sure they keep still. Again, they're not going to be thinking. Any questions on that? Okay, if you are trained in, in first aid, you're trained in that stuff, you already know what your obligations are. That's a whole different situation. Stick to what you do with that. If you are not trained, okay, can you be legal or legally sued for just acting within your means? Yes. No. no, it's called the Good Samaritan Law. You cannot. Here's where you will get sued though. You go in there saying, yeah, I'm a brain surgeon, and you're not. You see what I'm saying? Simple things, simple first aid, keeping them calm, slowing the bleeding, simple stuff, that's it, okay? Life over limb, we, we all understand that. So if the car is you know, bursting into flames, I better get them out of the car, and that's probably more important than the other uh, rest of the stuff. Don't let them burn up, you know what I mean? Okay. Fires, let's lead into the fires. Uh, truck fires can cause damage and injury. Learn the causes of these fires and how to prevent them. Prevention's everything, folks. Best way to get through an accident is don't have one. A million miles, folks. Knock on wood, no accidents in a commercial vehicle. That's not by chance, that's technique. 
that's paying attention, it's work, okay? That's knowing when not to be in these situations. We're gonna talk about fires. Know what causes a fire. Don't put yourself in that position. Do a good prairie trip, know your truck. You start smelling something burning, stop the truck and get it figured out. Don't continue and go, eh, it'll be okay. No, okay? Trust me, I've seen people do it. So causes of fires, the after crashes. So again, if anything is spilled, you don't use the flares. You want to use triangles, that's why we all carry triangles. Tires that get underflighted, uh, they can rub against other duels, they can start on fire. Electrical systems can start on fire. Fuel systems can start on fire. Cargo can start on fire. There's a lot of things that can light up. You know, we talked about the hub yesterday having proper oil level. You run out of oil there, the bearings go bad, that could start on fire. So fire prevention, do a good pre-trip inspection, do your in-route inspections, follow safety procedures, and continue to monitor everything on your vehicle. Very, very important. And then uh, caution, use normal caution in handling any flammable products. Firefighting. Should you pull into a gas station no. if you're on fire? No. <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh, people panic. Mm. No, we don't do that, okay? Should we park next to a big dry brush pile? No. 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 Think, okay? I know it makes sense now, but when you get put under pressure, things go weird. So pull off the road, park in an open area away from buildings, trees, brush, stuff like that. Don't pull into a service station and then notify emergency services. Okay, keep the fire from spreading. Before you try to put out a fire, make sure it don't spread any further with a single, with the engine fire. Turn off the engine as soon as you can. Don't open up the hood. Why, what would happen if you open up the hood on these? <laughs> yeah, it fuels the fire, right? More oxygen. Okay, so again, make sure you don't fuel it. Uh, for cargo or van fires or something that's in within a compartment, should we open up the compartment to check on it? No. no, not at all. Otherwise, the same thing fuels the fire. Okay, you got a fire in your vehicle, get the emergency personnel on their way. You got a fire extinguisher, it's supposed to be 5 BC, carry that with you. That's just buying you time, folks. That's all that's doing, buying you time. So get that phone call in and then get out there and do what you're doing with it. Does everybody understand how to use a fire extinguisher? These four bullets will kind of walk you through it. Aim at the base of the fire. Should you be downwind of the fire or upwind of the fire? If you're downwind of the fire, the smoke's coming right at your face. If you're upwind of the fire, the air is taking it away from you, right? So you want to be upwind. Where do we aim the fire extinguisher? Base of the fire, right? Yeah. Now when the flames go out, are we all done? No, keep extinguishing it until that extinguisher is gone or until that whole thing is cooled off, okay? The right, right fire extinguisher, these are the type fire extinguishers. Um, your type A or class A fire extinguishers, your wood, paper, ordinary combustibles, okay? Your Bs are gonna be your gas, your grease, stuff like that. So your Cs are gonna be electrical equipment fires and these are fires with combustible metals. You need to kind of know which fire extinguisher you, you need for which fire, okay? If you had a fire extinguisher that's only class A, what's normally gonna be in that class A fire extinguisher? Water. So if you have an oil fire or a grease fire or a gas fire and you hit that with water, what's gonna happen? It's gonna make it much worse. So again, make sure you understand your fire extinguishers and your fires a little bit. The minimum on the, the trucks and buses is five BC. 5 BC, okay? That should cover almost everything there. Alcohol and drugs. Uh, Comes to alcohol and drugs, can you drink and drive? Yeah. We talked about that yesterday. What's the BAC level for <coughs> commercial operators? Uh, 0.04. 0.04. What's the tolerance within 24 hours of being on duty? Zero. Zero tolerance. Zero. Okay. So there's your alcohol. Does everybody understand how your body goes through this? Your BAC? Your BAC, that's uh, basically about your body weight, the number of drinks you drink, and the amount of time you drink them in. Your body normally processes one drink per hour. So if you have six drinks, it will take the body generally six hours to process those drinks out of the system. Everybody understand that? Now that's the average person. If you got liver issues, you got body issues, you got whatever issues, it could take longer. Now, these are equal. These three things, I'll give you a question about that. These are the same amount of alcohol. So a 12 ounce glass of beer, a five ounce glass of wine, 
and an ounce and a half shot of uh, proof liquor, 80 proof liquor. Any questions on that? They're all about the same. They all do the same thing for you. All right. We need to know those numbers now, right, for the test? No, you only need to know the numbers. Okay. Just know that they're the same. Okay. So basically a shot of whiskey is just like a right. can of a glass of beer, and that's a glass of wine. That's okay. all. Right. Relative to the same drink. Alcohol goes directly through the bloodstream to the brain first. So that's why, you know, one drink could actually affect your driving. It affects how you think. Any questions on that? Okay. Any questions on your BAC? Now's the time to ask. Okay, alcohol in the brain, we just talked about that. Um, so ones that have that issue, you're gonna see them straddling lines, maybe jerking, quickie starts, not signaling, failing to use lights, stuff like that. You might notice that as the other driver. Obviously, if you're drinking and driving, you probably won't notice any of this. Okay, running stoplights and red lights. That's because the, the person that's been drinking has a tougher time distinguishing between green and red. That's another issue there. Plus, the reaction time is slower. Okay, it's compromised. Now, uh, let's see. Effects on the body. There's your BAC stuff and how that will affect the body, reducing uh, reaction time, stuff like that. Will coffee sober you up? No. Will cold shower sober you up? No. No, what's the only thing that's going to sober up that alcohol? Time. 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 That's it. Time. Sleep, don't do it. That's actually one of the biggest mistakes people make. They'll drink, drink heavily. Let's go out and party. Okay, yeah, I killed that bottle in the 30 pack. Woohoo! Great. But I slept three hours. I'm fine. <laughs> you drink a 30 pack, how many hours before that's out of your system? 30 hours, folks. Yeah. Do the math all the time, every time. You have to be hammered like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. That's the thing. How long alcohol affects your driving? You can read that stuff. I mean, this should be nothing new. This is stuff you should know in your car. There's a the truth and myth about alcohol. We just kind of went over that stuff. Other drugs besides alcohol, other legal and illegal drugs are being used more often. Law prohibits possession or use of many drugs while on duty. They prohibit being under the influence of any controlled substance or anything which can make you drive unsafe. Remember we talked about that. Any medication at all that could affect your safe driving, you have to account for it. You know, a common one that we see that's prescription is what? Blood pressure stuff, right? Blood pressure meds, can they affect your, your abilities? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it says around the bottle, don't drive until your body's acclimated to it. So think about all this stuff when you're out there. I mean, it's a no-brainer. If you're going to be out there, you know, doing a line of coke, obviously this ain't going to work for you. It's career, okay? So that's the obvious stuff, but it's the unobvious stuff that that gets you. That's why I said, if you're on any prescription medications, get a letterhead from your doctor, note from your doctor saying everything you're prescribed will not affect safe driving. Carry that with you. Make sure they have it with you at your employer wherever you go and play. <laughs> Oh, yeah, every time. You know, yep. Because oh, you know, here's what I think. Every time you hear someone's phone go off, the first thing, I swear to God, the first thing I think of is, oh, thank God that wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. Yeah. It's the first thing I think of. Okay, so pay attention to labels. Uh, you know, I've been on some drugs that were bad enough that they said, please don't sign any legal contracts for 30 days. Okay, I've been on some pretty good stuff out there. But make sure you're safe out there driving. Anything that influences your driving is illegal. So let me ask you this question. If you are emotionally distraught, is it legal for you to drive? No. no. So if you had a fight with a loved one or a significant other, is it legal for you really to be driving? No. no. If you're not there, it's not legal. What if you have hay fever, right? Everybody knows that, right? Allergies, that's getting that time of year, the eyeballs swell up. You're like, oh my God, that better cut the hay, right? Is it legal to drive with that going on? No. 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 Okay, so make sure you're ahead of this game. Uh, stay alert and fit to drive. Driving a vehicle for long hours is tiring, and the best of drivers become less alert. So get some sleep. Schedule trips safely during hours you would normally be awake. Exercise regularly. Okay. If you are sleep deprived, sleep deprivation, can they write you a Dewey for that? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's actually a formula that they can use on how much sleep you're lacking, and that will equal the amount of drinks. You can get a Dewey, so 
get sleep, folks, okay? Eat healthy, avoid medication. Visit your doctor routinely. Uh, while you're driving, keep cool. Don't get too hot, keep the climate just right, otherwise you get sleepy. Take breaks, here's the thing. By the time you're already feeling tired, it's too late. Okay, you need to stay active, you need to get up and move. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, recognize the signals of getting drowsy, yawning, stuff like that, take a stop. Illness, once an OMB becomes too old then it's illegal to operate a vehicle, you can't operate. Highlight this, this is the important part. You are allowed to drive to the nearest safe spot, that's it. So if you get really sick going down the throughway, you're allowed to get to the nearest safe spot. The rest area, that's it, that is legal. Other than that, you can't do it. Hazmat, there's three issues with hazmat, three reasons for the rules. Contain the product, communicate the risk, ensure safe drivers and equipment. Okay, those are the three things. Again, I'm not gonna ask a whole lot of that. So I'm just gonna move forward from that. And we just ask the three intentions, the three reasons. Okay, so if you have paperwork with that, that hazmat, make sure the paperwork stays in the door or driver's pouch. Uh, clear view within reach while driving or on the driver's seat when you leave the vehicle. Does everybody understand what placards are? Those are big signs on the side of the trucks and trailers on all four sides. Tells what the product is. Moving on. And I believe we got through that chapter. Okay, folks, we're done to the last 45 minutes of this.